we reserve all the uh, academic and all the research related questions for the end of his talk and after talk, which you should be really anticipating for. And let's uh, welcome him first. Hi, Rob. Hello. <laughs> oh, it's good to see you. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing great. 9.30 in the morning is a good time for me. I apologize <laughs> for everybody else who might be up very late or up very early, but I appreciate the effort. Um, so uh, we, we, we've known each other for a long time and I've been following your work and probably it's not just me. Everyone who's doing soft robotics and some interest in soft robotics would be following your work forever. Where do you get your inspiration? Comic books. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. I don't know, subconsciously, but I read a lot of comic books growing up, right. so I'm guessing is it, that's where. Is that still the case? I still do read comic books, that's right. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, I, I don't think, uh, I, I think it was probably baked in before I was 12. Wow, so what impressed you the most? Or, I guess it's a, uh, it's a combination of a lot of, uh, a lot of um, uh, ideas and images, but is there anything that just pops up in your mind? Um, so usually what I do is I just read the literature, look for new tools like Jigong's Tough Hydrogels a while ago and, um, uh, Hellrin's DEA, just, you know, try to learn as many tools as are available and kind of like, have you ever played bingo where there's a bunch of balls bouncing around and you kind of just pick out the balls until you get bingo. It's kind of like that. You just have a bunch of these balls bouncing around and then eventually you pick out the combination that is bingo and those balls for me are the tools that I learned from other people and bingo is probably something that's related to some technological fantasy that was implanted from science fiction at some point. Are you still uh, playing bingo? I, I've only played bingo <laughs> once in my life and it was it was a lot of fun. It was actually too much fun. I was with my grandma <laughs> but, yeah so is there any other hobbies that keep you occupied other than being in the lab i uh yeah gardening i have raised chickens uh make maple syrup and, oh wow uh, <laughs> and I, I started to raise uh catfish in uh in my pond so i'm gonna Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, now you're mentioning gardening. That reminds me of one of your papers with the um, succulents. Uh, is that oh, where that idea came from? Or is no, it that coincidence? A, that was coincidence. That was uh, James, James Peekle, who's a postdoc of mine. He's a professor at UPenn now. Um, and he, um, he just is an artist as well as a great scientist. And I think he just recognized that they're beautiful plants. I don't think there was anything other than that. No, I, I don't raise aloe plants or, or um, succulents, so. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> you, only bring, and... you, you only grow them in your lab. Yes. <laughs> Actually, I don't think we do. I think we just, uh, that one died pretty quickly. <laughs> we're, not, we're not very good at keeping things alive. <laughs> That's why it's good to work on robots. <laughs> So we are facing this great um, uh, world pandemic. And this is one of the reasons we are getting all together here with a new occasion, new opportunity, because the seminar series, I think would be more difficult to get people together if people were not so much of in tune with a Zoom. But I guess all of us are you know, part, you know, Zoom experts by now. Um, so with this challenge and with this changing climate, What's your, what's your outlook in terms of what we can do as scientists, as well as roboticists and, um, and even, even further, what do you think we can do? And where does our vision, should it align? And if it does, then what, what could we do? What, what should we look out for? Well, it seemed uh, when we thought, at least when I thought that 10% of the world could die from this, um, it was very terrifying. Um, so, uh, a lot of concern was about supply chain management and, you know, what, how can we have people go to work to do these things, these jobs when 10% of them could die? And, you know, what do we do? And these people that are working at Walmart and uh, grocery stores and, and things like that, um, they shouldn't have to go to work to supply us with the things we need so we can save our lives. Yeah. Luckily, it hasn't been as uh, you know, the mortality rate hasn't been as high as that, but it's uh, still obviously a problem. Um, but I, I think it's a lesson that we can deal with for the 
uh, now and in the future when something that does have a high, high mortality rate will keep even young people from working. And so um, autonomy, I think, is a, a real solution to that problem. It's maybe the only solution to that problem. And uh, luckily, we're all, a lot of times it feels like we're not in a place to solve real problems, at least me. I'm not creating cancer, um, HPV vaccines to cure cancer and, uh, or, you know, it, it, these things. So sometimes I feel like I'm working on stuff that can provide joy to people, but aren't really saving lives or anything. But this is an opportunity to use autonomy to actually save lives at a large scale. And so it's kind of exciting that we, I feel at least I've lucked into being in the, into a technological solution to a, um, a genuine problem. I, I, I think you get a lot of these questions. So um, in terms of your immediate application, um, we, uh, well, as a software bot, part of being a software bot community is about having a, a customizability of our robots and the, and then the easy, quote unquote, easy accessibility to the technology we're developing. So if you were to think about one direction that non-roboticists or non-scientists to approach uh, uh, to find uh, some sort of solution for their current problems and challenges, what do you think is the best approach? And what are the areas they can approach from? It's actually the <clears throat> totally opposite direction our research is heading, which is, uh, <laughs> I, think, I, I think you're saying modular, <laughs> modularity and accessibility for uh, people who aren't experts in, in robots. And that makes a lot of sense, like an Arduino kind of situation mm -hmm. um, to, for, for, for the non-expert to become uh, to make robots for their specific applications. Um, and I think that's, that, that's like the consumer electronics, uh, approach, which would be a really good one for a lot of people. Um, we in our lab are, are kind of moving in a direction towards integral component design. Um, and, uh, but for general use. So, mm. you know, the one thing that you make could be used for a lot of different things, but it would be very expensive and very intricate and probably not possible for a, um, for a, a person at home in their garage to make. Um, the cost would be very high too. So we're going in a very, in, in, in the opposite direction of that, um, of a modular design, it's integral design and very complicated. But the reason we're doing that is because we want to make um, autonomous robots that can operate for a long period of time. And in order to do that, we think you need to have um, self-healing, you need to have multifunctionality everywhere and very complex systems, uh, a very bio-inspired approach. And it's maybe not the right one, but uh, it's a direction. So that's where we're gonna go for. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thanks for sharing your vision in terms of uh, where, you're, where you're headed. So that, that's great. Uh, so what's, what's the biggest challenge now in, in terms of your, your vision? Yeah, already the world integral, that, that is already very, very challenging. But if you were yeah. to, if you can actually define it further, what's the biggest challenge? And the challenge that you are you know, iffy about, which is the challenge that you're most excited about and then when that's the, you're, you're less excited about, but still needs to be done. Well, I think there's two, a few perspectives. There's my perspective, there's a perspective of, um, students too. Hai Kui Chen, she was uh, in my group, my very first student. <laughs> and uh, she, and, you know, she works on a very difficult task, many difficult tasks. And our publication timelines, you know, it can take four years for, even though your student can take, it, it didn't take Kui Chen that long, but we, sometimes it could take four years to publish some of the things we work, we work on. And that's very risky for a student to invest that time in. Mm. Um, it, because this, because the, we're working in complex systems, um, and it's not, it's kind of like tissue engineering, where tissue engineering takes a long time, and there's a lot of risk involved. It's not at that level of risk, but still is. So, so making sure we do, we put some risk mitigation strategies up front, um, so that students don't go down a path that can result in. Um, no publication, although we also, one option is to publish results that don't work. 
um, and explain why they don't work so that people can learn from us too. It doesn't seem to be what graduate students want to do. They want to have something <laughs> that is a, you know, a world beating result that everybody will want to replicate in the future. But I also think that publishing things that don't work could be actually even more useful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and we have a few examples of that. So you think the major challenge is the publication for students, but okay. if that's the no issue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if it's not an issue, then what are the other um, challenges to, to what? Uh, to achieving your goal of having a completely integrated autonomous oh. robotic systems. We have like 35 participants who's listening right now and this will be online and YouTube. So if they have a couple of solutions, might be a good, oh, sure. good place to uh, pitch it out there that Rob Sheffer finds this to be a challenge, might have a solution coming up. Uh, wiring and power. Mm. Um, so to have a, you know, it's, out, it's a pretty mundane answer, I guess. But if you have a, but if you look at some of the robots today, like the normal, um, I mean, not normal, they're extraordinary, Atlas um, and, uh, you know, those boss dynamics and, uh, song-based cheetah and all these other things there's shit there's a lot of wiring in there and <laughs> and they and uh, getting and that's a lot of weight um it it means you have reduced functionality because you want to put things somewhere but you can't and uh so somehow and it, it makes your system very sensitive to failure like one of those wires gets messed up then your whole thing breaks down you have to take it apart with a modular system, that's not so bad because if something doesn't work, you pull it out, put the new thing in. But in an integral design, it's a huge problem. You have to take the whole thing apart and rebuild it. And right, that's if you right. haven't grown it. With, the, right. with our 3D printing stuff we're going, you may actually end up growing everything within each other and then you can't, it would be like surgery um, oh, that's fix. a good, I actually like that uh, term, uh, surgery. It really is a surgery. And if you hit the wrong wire, then you have to start from, who knows from where? And then how do you power each of those systems? Mm -hmm. I guess it goes into the wiring, you know, if, uh, but wireless power, wireless communication could help with that. But the mm -hmm. efficiencies are much lower in power transfer. So yeah, these are huge issues. Have you looked at any uh, powering system yourself? Um, and we've been seeing different types of combustion, chemical based, uh, solar power, um, some green energy with some um, algae and uh, uh, sugar. So is there anything that's completely uh, extraordinary or something that's more classical that you're, uh, you're, you're getting your mind on to? Uh, I love combustion power, mm -hmm. uh, small scale combustion. If Ronald or Cameron are watching, please let's hurry up with that. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, talking about it now and uh, we have some but I, we have some work on using uh, so I use bio biology uh, to um, guide our um, idea inventions like what do we need to make and the cardiovascular system is is a great um, biological achievement it's a very complex system um, and it's multifunctional you're delivering energy you're um, doing thermal management, you're removing waste. Um, and that's just some very high level things that our circulatory system does. Uh, but we, we, we use that to uh, take the idea that a liquid energy delivery system confluent throughout a body would be um, a good way to uh, have multifunctionality of uh, in a way it's a cheat because our blood doesn't actuate, but in this case, we use the blood to also be the actuating medium. Um, but there's a, a lot of potential to add more function in there, like um, communication between nodes um, for control. So you can um, have wiring do the same thing as power transfer and- um, Oh, wow. So is that what you're looking into right now? Um, trying to do a fluid uh, circuitry? Yes. Awesome. That's, right. That's a good awesome. way to put it. That's what we'll say. Thank you. <laughs> Let me introduce two editors from EML. So our editor in uh, in chief, this is Jimmy Sha. Jimmy, can you say hello to people? <laughs> Hi, Rob. Hi, uh, Jamie. How are Hi, you? Jimmy. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Good to see you again. Yeah, he is uh, checking in from um, from Singapore now. In Singapore, <laughs> it's uh, nearly ten p.m. <laughs> Thank you for staying up so late. Right, and Attorney Lee is uh, our uh, editor of EML. Yep. Hi everyone. 
Hey Rob, hey Jamie, Hi. thank you for being Hi. here, and also thank you for inviting me. Welcome all the our panelists. Yeah. Hey Jamie, do you want to briefly introduce uh, uh, the panelists? Great. Um, so I don't think we have all of all of you, but uh, good to see all the faces uh, um, in, in, in live motion. So we have um, Pi Chen, um, Professor Pi Chen Zhao, Assistant Professor at the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Tsinghua University. Welcome. Good to see you. So obviously, you. Uh, <laughs> obviously, you have some relation to Rob and mm -hmm. Soon to be Professor Ryan Trudy. Uh, currently, he's at MIT as a postdoc, but he'll be starting next year, correct? Here's, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so he'll be joining Northwestern next year, and um, uh, he, he'll be actually appointed in multiple uh, multiple departments. That's quite interesting. I, I, I've seen two, but not three. This is quite. A... No, it's just the two, but it's I, I just, yeah. It'll be it'll be a lot of fun. Looking forward yeah, to it. Yeah, I'm very excited for you as well. Which two? Right. I'll be in mechanical and materials. Wonderful. Okay. Congratulations. We, Thank you. Yeah. And we have a Dr. Phil Busco from yeah. Research Mechanical Engineering in the Functional Materials Division at US Air Force Research Lab. Yeah, thank you. Um, very happy to be part of the conversation today. Welcome. And then we have Dr. Nathan Lazarus from U.S. Army Research Lab. Definitely great to be here and be part of the discussion. This is really exciting panel. So, um, and then they, I've never actually had uh, uh, this, uh, this fast uh, re reply from everyone when they asked, asked them to join for the panels. So I, I congratulate myself for uh, actually reaching out to them and thanks Rob for recommending them. And thank you all for uh, being a very fast responders as well. That just means that how much they're anticipating your talk and very excited about the, uh, the post discussion. Maybe they actually want to give you a harder question. I don't know what the motivation is, but I'm very looking forward, very much looking forward to it. And then we have a, another panelist who will be soon joining us, uh, uh, Professor Kirsten Peterson from Corning University. So she'll be joining us soon uh, in a minute. I, I we can introduce ask another, uh, yeah, we can introduce another associate editor of EML, Sulin Zhang from Penn State. Hi, Rob. Uh, Hi, uh, uh, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Uh, how are you? Looking good, good. Looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I see a lot of new faces I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> a different world. A different world, yeah. Yeah, around the world with different yeah, times. Actually, uh, one of the greatest things of this EML webinar, every time we have new friends from different fields uh, coming together. Actually, from uh, different corners of the globe, and that's great. And that's why I have this back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. My laptop actually isn't good enough to have uh, some of the fancier backgrounds. Like uh, Jamie has a custom background. I need to get a better laptop. There's some kind of limit <laughs> limitation on Zoom that doesn't allow it. <laughs> oh, hi, John. Oh, we have uh, another panelist. Uh, don't need of an introduction here. <laughs> hey, <John. laughs> hey, everybody. Good to see you. <laughs> hey, Rob. Hey, John. Really Hi, good to see you. Yeah, looking forward to the talk. Be good. Hey, hey Rob. I recall uh, meeting you first time, I think it was first time, on a train. Do you yes, remember right. which train? We had a uh, long conversation. Yes, it was that was fun. Yeah, we uh, it was to uh, it was in Switzerland, but um, to the Italian part of Switzerland oh. for for um, I think the very first RoboSoft conference. Oh, the the computational morphology conference, yeah, right. two thousand eleven. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's the right. only reason I remember is because I came to Switzerland right after that year. So. But do you remember, is it Lugano? Was that where it was? Yeah, Ticino. Ticino. It's Lugano, okay. yeah. Yeah, well, anyway, yeah, hey, I saw Kirsten. you. Hi, Kirsten. I saw you on the train I'm... and I knew you wouldn't recognize my, my face, but it looked like you were asking somebody for something, but they didn't <laughs> speak English. So I was like, okay, I can help finally. I can, I can actually <laughs> send information the other way this time. <laughs> 
um, but which is a, remarkable because usually I get lost very easily. Yeah. Did you get your undergraduate uh, degree? Oh no, it's a graduate degree from UIUC with a uh, with a uh, um, Lewis, right? That's right. Yeah. And my undergraduate degree from from UIUC. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, and oh. uh, and a business degree. <laughs> I was there for a long time. I had oh. to cover all the tracks. <laughs> oh, this this is for, this is my first time. I know that the Rob is associated with UIUC. There are quite a few, yeah. quite a few of us panelists associated with UIUC, right? Great place. Yeah. Yeah, I think we tried to hire you, didn't we, Rob? We, we unsuccessfully tried to get you to join a MEC. You could yeah. have stood in Urbana for a very long time. I don't know why. I know. My, my mom, who lives in Peoria, was very upset. Uh, everybody was <laughs> upset. She wasn't the only one. Oh, well, thanks for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. so, was, Jennifer, like place. with Jennifer, you must uh, 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 done this uh, um, 3D printing, but is that right? You know, I started off make printing ceramics with her, mm -hmm. and then um, I switched to working on microfluidic uh, synthesis of particles, uh, which used a lot of the same uh, uh, condensed matter physics and rheology that we applied to 3D printing, but uh, did it in microfluidics. Actually, I was one of the few people in the group not working on 3D printing for most of it. Um, and uh, it, Ryan had uh, just joined, I think he joined two years after I left the group maybe. Yeah, I was headed to UIUC and then went to Harvard. <laughs> There's a, yeah, I got to unpack all of your stop flow uh, <laughs> stuff and just throw it in a drawer. <laughs> <laughs> but we kept it. Okay, well, thank you. I yeah. probably try to get it back sometime. <laughs> hey, Jenny, do you mind to introduce uh, our panelist as a person to the rest of the panel? All right. And then from uh, your IUC, you, you went to Harvard. That's right. I'm actually wearing the uh, new, new George White. Red group swag right now. <laughs> I'm not sure why they chose this form of Gibbs free energy, but uh, that's what they did. <laughs> I'm not used to seeing it in that form, but anyway, I'm sure they had a good reason. <laughs> I think you were co-author or lead author maybe on some of the very early soft robotics, the little four four legged thing and the yes. panic. I think I might have handled that one or reviewed that one or something. I remember that. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> um, I think that was a con contribution um, from, from George. I was thankful that he used it. That's I think. right. Yeah. So he roped me in as a referee on that one. <laughs> I think I gave you guys the thumbs up. I thought it looked pretty good. So Thank everyone's you. look at the family tree of soft robotics uh, <laughs> here. <laughs> I will just introduce our uh, next, uh, the last panel member, Professor uh, Kirsten Peterson from Cornell University. Uh, she's also one of the uh, experts in the soft robotics community and she focuses on the bio and spy robot collectives and their natural counterparts. Welcome, Kirsten. Thank you, sorry, I'm late. <laughs> I think we, um, so Rob gives, starts giving a talk at, at the hour or when should I introduce Rob? are at the hour you introduce Rob. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Rob, I just uh, let me remind you one thing. Uh, you uh, use your cursor mm -hmm. uh, on, to point things on the okay. screen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> your family tree comment reminded me that I do have a like history of uh, soft robotics, but I didn't put it in this. So I'm trying to quickly scan through uh -huh. old presentations to put it in. Or maybe, uh, Jamie, we can ask you some questions. Oh, me? <laughs> yeah, did you uh, do your undergraduate and a graduate uh, degrees? I, I travel a lot. So my uh -huh. undergrad is from uh, Vancouver, uh, University yeah. of British Columbia. Mm -hmm. And I got a job in Korea at Samsung and I went to Samsung right after. So it wasn't really direct uh, transition. And um, 
I was not so fascinated by the printers. And I, at the time, Samsung actually had printer division and I was hired by printer division. I didn't realize if I had stuck around, maybe I would be working on 3D printers by now. But, um, <laughs> and then I went to Seoul National University and that's where I got my PhD. And um, I did my postdoc at uh, Paris and then at Harvard. And now I'm in Switzerland, EPFL. Your degrees are in mechanical engineering? Correct, all the way. Okay, right. So, fantastic. All right. So maybe, Rob, uh, you want to uh, set up your sure. your, your screen sure. again? Yeah, just, yeah, just like to... for, those, for those who don't know, Rob actually was uh, uh, and EML, Young Investigator Award. Right. Young Investigator Award. <laughs> 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 okay. 2016. Wonderful. Super. <laughs> Thank I you. appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, all right. Yeah, I will share my screen. I did manage to find that timeline, so I inserted it. Yeah. Right. So, uh, Rob, uh, you practice your cursor. So, we, we uh, can we see your <laughs> All right. It's uh, one or two um, speakers forgot to use your cursor. It was very miserable <laughs> to imagine what this person was talking about. <laughs> okay, I'll use it. And I've never yeah. used the laser pointer function, so this will be fun. Well, that's even better. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll minimize. Maybe you can con continue. So it's your. <clears throat> okay, I'm not going to be able to see video from you all. Oh. So I'm going to minimize that. Yeah. Oh. Video? Very good. Yeah. Uh, Mana. I should get some. I should invest in more technology. <laughs> An <laughs> Maybe old laptop you computer? and a second monitor. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the least technological person I know, which is funny, but uh, okay. So should I start? Well, uh, maybe I can introduce uh, okay. to the rest of the world uh, who you are and then you can start. I'll, 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 I'll make it short. Um, okay. So welcome everyone to EML series, uh, seminar series. My name is Jamie Peck. I'll be introducing Professor Rob Shefford uh, before his talk. Professor Rob Sheffery really does not need an introduction to the uh, robotics community, especially soft robotics community. Basically. But if you are just joining freshly, uh, uh, Professor Shefford is an associate professor at Cornell University in the Sibley School of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. He received his Bachelor of Science in Material Science and Engineering and the same field, uh, PhD in the same field. But what's interesting, we found out today, he also has the uh, MBA from University of Illinois as well. So at Cornell, he runs the Organic Robotics Lab, ORL, as you can see on the screen already. He focuses on using methods of invention, including bias-fired design approaches in combination with the material science to improve machine function and autonomy. So before his lecture, we were talking with Rob in terms of his vision for his lab and what his interests are. And I'm really excited to hear about his new talk on optoelectronic sensing of the deformation of soft robots and their electrohydraulic power. So Rob, screen, screen and microphone and everything is yours. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, uh, you'll notice the title is different. It's, it <laughs> captures the same thing, but uh, I just felt it was a bit of, it's a more encompassing uh, talk than I had initially planned. One reason is that um, this mechanics community is so excellent that I feel if I was to describe the mechanics involved in our publications, it wouldn't really be teaching you anything. They're existing tool that we just use it. We don't develop new mechanics really, but these are applications for hyperelastic materials that I think uh, people would be interested in seeing. So I'm highlighting that. And it's also an honor to be invited to this um, on, on the panel are my uh, friends, people who have inspired me and just greats um, in the field that lead the way. So it's great. Um, what you see in this background is sort of what <clears throat> I'm kind of envisioning the goal of my research group is to do, which is to uh, integrate 
uh, power and sensing and actuation in a distributed way and in a more natural way um, into robots. Uh, to do that, um, these, are, these are some of the steps we're taking. The first is using soft materials, and in our case, <clears throat> specifically low elastic modulus, high ultimate strain materials, which are akin to uh, biological soft tissues in their mechanical properties. And the reason we're doing all this is there's a pretty big contradiction that exists in robotics right now, um, and that is uh, endurance versus agility. We have, thanks to wheels, highly enduring uh, autonomous vehicles that can go for, in the case of uh, electrical ones, greater than 300 miles um, at 200 miles per hour with incredible accelerations. But the cost of this is um, financial, um, at least in the tune of, actually today it's around a trillion dollars worth of investment in the US highway system to engineer the ground to be flat so wheels can work on it. But obviously there are many situations where um, we, we need, wheels don't work. Um, and if we could actually have systems that would work without wheels to some degree of efficiency, uh, the cost of um, the economics might change, you know, in a very high, highly aspirational view. Uh, and for agility, we also have very agile robots. You've all seen Atlas doing backflips and I don't know if it does the splits yet, but probably soon, uh, but it can't do these things for very long definitely not compared to um, biological organisms or organisms. And so there's this contradiction that we would hope to solve. And animals have, you know, solved this. They're definitely deficient in some ways compared to uh, synthetic machinery, especially the internal combustion engine. Um, but they can do dramatic things. We used to deliver mail with horses. A Pony Express rider would, you know, ride its horse around 15 miles at 10 miles per hour, and then they would switch horses and continue on their way. Doesn't sound great compared to, you know, a, a car, but when you consider they weren't doing this on roads, it's really remarkable. Um, at least most of the time, not on roads we consider today. Um, so uh, in this the design of the organism's power system um, and actuators, but one thing they do is very simply is capture about 40% of the work um, from, from running in ligaments and then they rec recover it later. And that's a very simple thing we can do uh, with elastomers. Um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but, you know, it, to capture why biology is so much better than our synthetic robots, um, we have hundreds of skeletal muscles, tens of thousands, depending on how granular you want to get with it. Um, robots have tens of actuators at most. We have vasculature that delivers highly energy dense fluids um, to our muscles so that they can operate at high power for a long time and also just thermal management of these muscles. Um, we have, uh, robots have a centralized power system with a lot of wiring um, to, tr to, to send power to our few actuators. We have a nervous system which uh, synthesizes sensory inputs from tens of thousands of touch receptors as well as vision and hearing and um, robots have a, a centralized control unit that fuses um, a few sensors, like a few touch sensors, uh, vision primarily. And uh, the reason we can do this and robots can't is that we're grown from the bottom up and they're assembled from the top down. So there is um, a maximum level of complexity you can achieve with our current manufacturing techniques for robots that aren't there biologically. And we've, I've been talking a lot about um, you know, animals, but even plants make these kinds of uh, uh, trade-offs between endurance and adaptability. This is a palm tree that's blowing in a, win in, in a wind um, during a hurricane. Um, and I think we're gonna get some lagging in this, that's okay. Uh, what you see though is the, the, the leaves, which are optimized towards two goals, survival of the plant from, which one goal, survival of the plant, but they have to capture energy, um, which means the plants have, the, the leaves have to be broad. They can't be heavy because they'll weigh the, they'll prevent the tree from growing. But in a, in a wind, that's a sail, but in the wind, uh, they would break the branches off and the leaves off if they didn't do something. So the, 
compliance has been engineered so that under wind they'll fold, fold in the direction of the wind, bend in the direction of the wind, and then when the wind stops, they'll come back and start um, collecting energy again. They'll also, if they do break off or the branch breaks off, grow another one. So self-healing is something we do in our group, but it's not, I'm not talking about it today, but it's another important thing that we can do with soft materials that is harder to do with um, harder materials. Uh, to set context in, um, in robotics, it hasn't been around that long. Of course, machine elements have been around a long time and automation of them as well. But focusing towards a robot, um, the first word uh, of it was used in 1921 in Carl Capek's uh, play, Rossum's Universal Robots. And what I think is really um, cool about it is his robots were grown, synthesized from a green sludge. Um, but the first play uh, that reenacted the, the text was a hard, just depicted as a hard metal robot, just due to the limitations of theater. Uh, but the whole, the first intent of the word robot was a synthesis approach. Um, so to go along with that vision, uh, you know, nature has provided a similar solution where um, nature de usually designs with toughness in mind and not necessarily strength. So we can have equivalent or better toughness or you know, somewhat less toughness, but still highly tough soft materials um, without reaching the strengths of uh, metals and ceramics in cases where we do need that high strength. Of course, we know that bone and dentin and stuff fills that goal, role, but mostly our, the, the majority of the tissue that composes uh, organisms are soft. And elastomers are our best um, synthetic uh, analog to that. So I pulled this um, history of soft robotics, which is of course the direction I'm going in, uh, from my, my recent student's thesis, uh, Shuo Li. And uh, so, so he went through and just sort of figured out major events in the um, timeline of soft robotics. And in the early 90s, um, uh, Susan Mori had this very advanced uh, pressure-driven tentacle motion that he used to make a manipulator. Um, Ian Walker had a, a tendon-driven continuum arm. Uh, Heinrich Jaeger uh, and Hod Lipson created this jamming gripper. Um, what isn't captured in here is the funding sources and the, uh, that, that spurred all this stuff. Um, but around 2010 and 2011, at least in the US, DARPA was um, encouraging this research through a, a ChemBots program and then a maximum mobility and manipulation program, which is when I got involved with uh, George Whitesides to create this uh, little fluid driven thing that looked more organismal than, than say this, but in principle worked pretty similarly. A company, uh, Soft Robotics Incorporated came out of that work um, and it's doing really well in agricultural product handling and, and other logistical operations which I think is important in supply chain management, especially um, with the, the new interest in solutions for pandemics. Um, and then uh, we, you know, popular media started uh, getting the idea here and Big Hero 6, and then actually in, in one of the animated Spider-Man movies, there's basically this as the uh, Dr. Octopus. Uh, and, and then, so, and now it's getting more into how do we make these things actually do useful things and part of that is energy systems. Um, so this Octobot I think is a good thing and Brian Truby who's a panelist was involved in that. Um, and then what is also is missing is the uh, European efforts and the Italian Institute of Technology has did a lot of really important groundwork to form things like the IEEE Soft Robotics um, Society I guess you'd call it. Um, but anyway so sort of the timeline is it, soft robotics have been around for a long time. Um, so I want to describe how soft artificial muscles are useful. This is some unpublished older work. Actually, I did this in George's group and, uh, I just made this little gripper that when you pressurize it, you can see the fingers kind of wrapping around the, this fennel. And that is a material computation. There's a stress input that causes a strain output. And when you have a hard, highly torqued robot, um, that is happening too, but the robot overcomes these stress inputs, so you don't notice it. In fact, it, it could just, if there's no sensory feedback, just 
squash through that fennel. And so a lot of what these motions can reduce, can do some pre-processing, mechanical pre-processing that a robot, a more complex robot could use to navigate an environment with lower computational loads. Um, another application, and I, I really do hope these videos play. I'm gonna actually, I don't think it's the laser pointer issue, but I, I just wanna get rid of it anyway. Okay, actually I think it was somehow at the laser pointer. Um, so this is uh, a haptic interface we created for using the, the HTC Vive uh, VR environment. Um, and so there's a little sleeve that goes over the handle and it changes the shape. And there is haptics in, as you know, your phone, your VR controllers, whatever, that, but it's vibrotactile. So it vibrates to let you know you've touched something, but there's no persistence of touch. If the, if the thing vibrates for a long time, it's annoying. So you don't want that. Um, and so what this provides is a, is a large shape change, a forceful one that can actually move your hand and then, and then stay there. So we demonstrated this, we worked on this with NVIDIA um, and demonstrated it at a, at a pretty um, big conference. And they really liked, people really liked the, uh, our haptic solution versus the Viber tactile one. We have some qualitative uh, information from surveys that um, statistically shows they prefer it. But the, you know, one of the downsides is that we have to provide pressure fluid to that controller. Um, and in the case of VR headsets, it used to be they were tethered anyway, so that wasn't such a big deal, but now they're untethered. So that is a challenge that needs to be solved. Um, mass transport in these fluidic systems in order to um, make them useful to the consumer. There's still obviously advantages um, where you, uh, you don't need to untether it, but my goal is to get similar results with an un untethered systems, whether they be fluid or not. Um, but these fluid systems are just so, they work so well. Uh, so this is another a game we made. Those are what those were previous uh, haptic examples are abstract. They um, didn't represent what was physically going on, but they were just fun. In this case, there's a steel sword and a pressurized cylinder that feels hard to your brain. It feels as hard as steel because your muscles get tired in seconds if you put your squeeze on it. And then essentially it's the same thing as steel. Um, then you can deflate it and then it feels like foam. And so then there's a foam sword in the game and it, feel, it feels like foam because that's what it is, um, but you can't pop balloons with it. So, you know, this is a game, but there are obviously training um, events like fire, firefighters training with hoses, hoses and many other examples where um, this direct representation of haptics is important. Um, this, this is a, you know, what I was talking about before, um, this, this little quadruped, and, and this is another example of these tethered problems um, that we have to get rid of. In this case, I'm controlling it. So it's a machine, it's not a robot, unless you consider the um, material uh, intelligence as a computation and sort of feedback mechanism, in which case you could esoterically argue it's a robot. But I found that doesn't work at all with roboticists, they don't care. They think it needs to have normal sensors that feed a controller that cause a, an autonomous response to the particular situation they're in. And I think both are true. Uh, but I certainly do think you need traditional feedback control systems to do really useful work. So we embrace that um, criticism. This is still a feed forward machine. Uh, there's air compressors in here that are pressurizing bladders and causing it to move. This is a meter long um, uh, uh, still machine. Uh, all the electronics are captured in the center. You can run over it because it's a very tough rubber and it'll keep going. Sorry. Okay. Um, and okay. So that so mobile robots that are uh, tough and you know flame resistant, uh, resistance to so acids and caustic environments and, and you know these things are potential applications. Uh, this is a very specific application for a soft robot, which would be in a, a left ventricle assist device. Currently. Um, if your heart is beating weakly, uh, you need to assist it. And the best, the, the current solution to that technical solution is to put a hole in your left ventricle and then suck blood out of it 
Um, and then that problem uh, is the problem with that, several of them, you you actually chop up the uh, blood cells when you do that. Uh, and if you turn it off, uh, then you die. So you don't want to turn it off, but you have a hole in your heart. It's not compatible with uh, pediatric cases because your heart is still growing there. So there's a lot of problems with it. One potential um, application for soft robotics would be just a, a sleeve that fits around that heart. Uh, and then this is a uh, video of the first version of, of that sleeve. You can see how we designed it. We worked with a uh, uh, CT images of, of uh, real hearts. It's actually a pig heart. Um, created a 3D printed model and then molded uh, a foam, a pneumatic foam actuator uh, we made off of it and then patterned the inextensible and extensible regions so that it would direct the pressure inwards but not compress um, the coronary arteries because you still need to power the heart so you don't want to squeeze those coronary arteries. Uh, even with the limitations of the mass transport of the gases, oh, I should also point out that pneumatics is, a, is an appropriate power source in heart devices. A, a, a total artificial heart uh, is, at least one of them, is run off of a pneumatic input. So it, it is, it's done. Uh, well, it's not the ideal solution, but it, it's better than dying. So this is a, uh, this is our sleeve and the, our pressure inputs that are triggered by an ECG. So this is actually a robot. There's a, there's a sensor input and an actuator output. Uh, we could modulate this response based on, the, based on these inputs, but right now it's just a switch. As an example of a very different kind of robot than, you, than you'd um, normally think of, this is it pumping um, simulated blood it, through, the, through the heart and uh, seeing that the pressure, we, can, we get these pressure spikes and then corresponding flow rates. Um, this is within an order of magnitude of what you would need from a left ventricle assist device, but we still need, would need to like double or triple the flow rates for it to, to be useful. And to do that, we would need to just optimize um, the design of the sleeve um, as well as you know, the uh, fluidic handling system, but it's, it's certainly within reach. Uh, so this is a pretty complicated manual procedure on taking this heart and creating this sleeve to not press on the arteries, still get significant enough actuation. Um, and so how, how we can automate that process in the future um, is by, uh, we, we came up with in a, shoot, actually need to delete this thing so you can see it. Um, a way to predict how your actuator is going to inflate using pretty simple means. If you have a sheet and you inflate it into a balloon, um, you can predict the radi there's radial and circumferential inflation. You can predict the radial strain like this, and these are your original origin points, and these are where you get to, this is where this point gets to after you inflate it. Um, it's kind of hard to predict using this equation, but if you constrain the circumferential expansion, uh, then the radial strain is predictable um, simply with this ratio of, uh, of this coordinate to this one. And, um, and so that's what James Peekle did. Uh, and he, in order to constrain the radial inflation, he's put concentric rings around the features he wanted to protrude. And then uh, uh, created a, a little model uh, based on the, the fraction of these rings in the total area of the uh, elastic or hyperelastic membrane. And using this idea, he was able to um, create positive, zero, and negative curvatures based on how he patterned these, uh, these rings. Uh, you can see where you don't want the material to stretch, you put a lot of inextensible fabric, and where you want it to stretch uh, a lot, you have a, a lower fractional percentage within that area. And then you can tune the shapes. Uh, using, using that, and he has, he created a, 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 a script to actually take a 3D scan of the object you want, and then produce the pattern you need to produce something like this aloe plant. This isn't uh, 
a high aspect ratio allo plant because the we're still working with uh, the ultimate strain limitations of the elastomer. But if you could pattern to higher resolution, we use the laser cutter, but if, if you had a higher resolution patterning method, it's conceivable you could, um, you could one, make a higher resolution topography, uh, but perhaps even get higher aspect ratios out of your inflated system. Uh, so we think, so we have a good control over the shapes that we can make with these uh, inflatable systems. Um, tethering is a problem and, and one, another, to get to higher resolution on why tethering is a problem, you have, here's a, here's a small version of the quadruped that I talked about before. Um, here's the uh, published one. These are all playing at the same pressure inputs of gas. And then this is the, the meter scaled one. The video I showed you before was sped up, I think, four times when it was moving around. It's a very slow and lumbering quadruped. <clears throat> um, we can make it go faster by using higher pressures because that, of course, increases the flow rate into the, into the chambers. But we have to do that anyway for this to bear any load beyond its own weight as well. As the length of the robot increases, the weight goes up as the cube of that, um, but the force transduced by the pressure only goes up as the square. So we definitely lose as you make the robots bigger. We also lose when you go very small because of the pressure drop from moving these fluids, but since they're inviscid, it doesn't really matter at the scales I'm showing you. But really we need higher pressures and higher flow rates to get, um, to get large and useful, uh, robots that could do something like Atlas does. Um, of course, I, I, my, my solution now is not just make totally soft robots, hybrid systems, um, and I'll get to a little bit of that later. But this is that, <clears throat> this sped up video of that robot moving earlier. And you can see the, um, that we had this sort of bandage on it. Um, and that's because this layer, this is a, a, a layered assembly of rubber and this bonded layer is very weak relative to the pressures we need to get this robot to carry all this stuff. And that's, that's the situation when I left Harvard and came to Cornell, uh, Mike Tolley and I uh, were trying to get this thing to work and we're doing lots of surgeries on these things. Um, and you know, uh, Zhao Hui Chen, who was my first student and the reason I managed to, to succeed at Cornell. Um, but we came up with this rotational casting a solution um, which gets rid of the, the layered assembly problem. So it's a monolithic casting of rubber. This is also my first paper, which is an extreme mechanics letters. Um, so thank you very much for help, helping, uh, allowing us to publish our work and, and really get us going. The result is you can have monolithic uh, structures. There's, this is a sphere, a hollow sphere. So there's nowhere for it to preferentially rupture except for defects in the material itself and not an assembly problem. As a result, we could uh, pressurize the same type of actuator that you saw in the video before <clears throat> to uh, like 35, 40 pounds per square inch, whereas before we were limited to like 18 before you would start to rupture things. And that allows you to do some real work in excess of just lifting the body and moving it around. Uh, but as I said, soft, uh, isn't always a good thing. The reason you don't see any large uh, animals without skeletons walking around Earth is because we, you know, the better solution, um, it, the better solution is dealing with gravity via a skeleton. This is a video, of, this is a picture of an octopus that's trying to hunt <clears throat> on, on, on the beach. And it can do that, but it looks really horrible doing it. It's ex using a lot of calories to get stiffness by contracting its muscles to move around, whereas we just use a skeleton, an endoskeleton specifically for us. And so we thought a good way to get this uh, benefit of a stiff uh, endoskeleton, but still the shape reconfigurability of a soft actuator was to have a meltable endoskeleton. So using silicone foam, which uh, I haven't talked about, we have actuators based off of foams, uh, and imbibing it with a uh, field's metal, we could create a very stiff block and then at a very relatively low temperature, make it very soft and formable. Uh, as you stretch this block, 
it gets stronger in the direction you stretch it. That's a lot like what bone does based on its mechanical loading. And I think we heard that from Rob Ritchie's talk. Um, but it, it probably gets very weak in the orthogonal directions. We didn't measure it, but um, that would probably be one of the trade-offs. We did something kind of kind of what I thought was cool, which is to form, take that, uh, that block, form it into a cylinder, uh, and then freeze that strain in with the metal so you can have a single, single actuation event um, as well. Okay, so uh, I think skeletons are good. If you can have a morphable skeleton, that's great, but probably since endoskeletons seem generally useful on land, you might not have to be morphable. <clears throat> um, but one thing is getting rid of that tether. Um, one, uh, one way to get rid of it is to still use pumps uh, but have a higher energy density fuel that gets circulated in the robot. Uh, right now, most demonstrations of these fluidic pneumatic actuators anyway are with a cylinder that you never see in the videos and that provides gas, uh, but also hydraulic ones, which are kind of off to the side uh, with a pump that's pumping fluids. So we thought, um, let's, let's go with uh, an energy system that's compatible with fluidics um, but it's also the hydraulic fluid. Um, we are doing it, even though one of our goals is to move this onto land, um, starting off underwater is a really good place to start for, for more complex robotic systems and soft robots so that we don't have to start adding the skeletal part yet. And that's what we did with this um, lionfish demonstration of an electrohydraulic power system. This uh, this fish, which again, James People created, um, is, has two actuators. Um, one is a, is a fin in the back that causes it to swim, and the other is the, these pectoral fins, which then sort of inflate. And they don't do anything other than uh, mimic nature, which I think that's a, um, to, to, to scare off predators. But if you look inside of this fish, it's pretty complicated. Um, there's two pumps, there's a microcontroller, um, and then there's the electrical system to communicate between the microcontroller and the pumps. Um, and then, but these pumps, what they do is they move fluid around the tail fin or around the pectoral fin. And this fluid is a, is a zinc iodide um, electrochemistry, which not only pressurizes the actuator, but also powers uh, the pumps. So this is the um, two half cells uh, powering this pump, uh, this zinc iodide chemistry, which can be the same on, on both sides of the cells. We, it's not a full uh, redox flow battery because one side of it is actually a, a solid but flexible uh, anode and the other, the, the, cath the cathode is a fluid. And you can pump the cathode, the catholite from one side to the other to cause actuation. Uh, you can see it being pumped through here. This is actually a, a, a food coloring for this video, but in actuality, it does look like even a more um, uh, anyway. It looks like it looks like blood, arterial kind of blood. But in this graph down here, you can look at the trade-off or not um, or the benefit for replacing inert hydraulic fluids with ones that can carry um, uh, electrical potential. Uh, you, as you increase the energy density of the hydraulic fluid, which is the bottom axis, um, any volume element of the hydraulic fluid will be able to carry more energy. And so then you also have to look at the fractional uh, hydraulic availability in the system you're looking at. And in most hydraulically powered robots, like Atlas, for example, there isn't that much hydraulic fluid. But in the case of our underwater lionfish, it's uh, at least half fluid in terms of volume. So there's a huge benefit of switching to um, the electrohydraulic system over the passive hydraulics before. And it, to us, it actually, it ends up creating four times more operational lifetime by using electrohydraulic fluid over a passive one. What this also means is uh, instead of re-engineering existing designs, to take advantage of this concept, you'd have to start from the ground up um, in most cases to get the real benefit of it. 
And so this is, this is it swimming again. It's at 2x playback, so it's not a very fast swimmer. And I apologize for the um, sporadic playback. But that's not because of the energy density. That's because of the power density. So um, it would be straightforward to increase the speed at which this can swim by increasing the surface area of electrodes. Um, and that's certainly possible. But this, this, um, that adds complexity. And to, to handle this complexity, we are um, relying on 3D printing. But this wasn't, this was, we printed a mold for this, but cast off of it. Um, I'll show you later on in the talk how we're using 3D printing to um, do things that would allow this to work at higher power densities as well as energy densities. Um, so, but so far, I haven't, I've, I've only shown you one example of an actual robot, which is the um, heart sleeve. Uh, to add, to make these things real robots, we are adding, we're innervating every part of the machine with uh, touch sensors or strain sensors. And we're choosing to do this optically. Uh, these are stretchable, these are rubber light guides that um, communicate with each other to report uh, strain information to a controller that can cause the robot to change its behavior. Um, this is another paper by uh, Zhao Hui Chen, who uh, in 2016 created a stretchable light guide with a high index of refraction core and a low index of refraction cladding. Uh, and when she stretches it, she gets a log linear dependence on the power output. This is a log scale. But um, the, it's very repeatable and can happen over tens of thousands of cycles so far in other, in other work we uh, are about to publish. So um, it's, an, it's a different method of getting uh, stretchable strain sensors uh, compared to, let's say, stretchable capacitors or uh, stretchable resistors. Uh, optics have some advantages over those systems and probably also some disadvantages. Uh, but we're uh, creating, we're really invested in, the, in this system. So these are stretchable fiber optics. They're, um, they're, the numerical aperture isn't that high. Um, so, but we have about 0.54 and what that results in is about a plus or minus 30 degree angle that it can accept light from in a, that's okay uh, but in LEDs kind of a lot of light gets lost here but once it's in our critical angle is around 70 degrees um, so the light stays trapped um, but we actually want to use it as a sensor so we want to modulate the power in the light guide mechanically and we do that in two ways um, one is through Beer's law where um, essentially so when you stretch it you're essentially increasing the, you are increasing the length of the light guide, which is effectively like adding light guides to each other, at least from our modeling. Uh, we get that you have a, a logarithmic dependence on strain, and that's what, uh, this is what, that's what the experiments bear out. Uh, I apologize for my dogs barking. Um, so, okay, this is uh, a prosthetic hand or robotic manipulator that looks like a hand, whatever way you want to take it. But Hui Chen put uh, two, three stretchable light guides per fluidically actuated finger and is pressing on them. Uh, and you get a, a tip force measurement as well as a curvature and pressure measurement from the other two light guides. So using this uh, and to sort of explain why it's useful, she topographically mapped, and this is a real robot now, that arm really, uh, yeah, so she's topographically mapping the tomatoes, figuring out their positions and pressing on each one. Um, and based on the stress strain response um, or the amount of displacement versus the force it takes to displace from each of these, each one of these fingers is like a mechanical testing machine. You can figure out which is the least resistant to displacement and that's the ripest one. So that's what uh, you pick. Um, but you can't really tell so in these light guides, if I stretch in the middle versus the beginning or the end, it's hard to tell where the deformation is occurring. So we're using, uh, we started to use frustrated internal reflection to localize the position of stress um, in these, in these in networks of light guides. And so once you have your trapped light, um, if you get rid of the cladding and you touch two light guides together, then you can couple light from one into the other and that will give you um, 
location specific information about where the deformation is happening. You can see this in Patricia's very, Patricia Shue's very first sort of proof of concept. Um, she has blue light coming from one direction, red light coming from another. And as she presses the light guides into each other, depending on the direction the light is traveling, one of these um, unpowered light guides will get lit up blue or red. Uh, the intensity that each unpowered light guide emits light at is uh, proportional to the distance between them. So you can interpolate location as well. Uh, Patricia created or printed these uh, foam networks with porous cladding in between um, so that she could create complex networks of these light guides and, and in programmable structures. The idea being when, when you're designing a robot from the bottom up, you can choose what locations are more sensitive to deformation than others, and then uh, increase the density of sensors towards those locations. Uh, her first demonstration is this. Um, this actually, uh, what, what is playing music, and that sound is proportional to how much she's pressing on these light guides. So you have location information from the um, coupling, and you have pressure information from the intensity. Uh, she created even, because she's incredible um, with many things, including CAD, she created this very complicated uh, foam lattice structure with a helical core for the, pow for the powered light guide, and then these tangent uh, U-shaped uh, unpowered light guides from which we're monitoring the light output. And then she modulated, modulated the spring response with this corkscrew in the middle, um, did some finite element analysis to predict what kind of coupling behavior we should get based on the force applied to the top of the cylinder, and then created a model that could predict the shape of the cylinder based on the power, the raw power output of the light guides. She printed the cylinder to be soft in the middle, and, that's, and that is where it's buckling first. Um, she also, these white dots are for digital image correlation between the uh, predicted, to get the, the ground truth. And if you compare the ground tr truth to the, to the model, there's um, in this, I think, 12 centimeter tall cylinder around three millimeter error, uh, which is similar to our, our backs. If you're to touch your back, you can't really tell where you are to within a positional accuracy of three millimeters. So I think it's pretty good. Um, not as good as our fingertips, but definitely better than any robot that exists now. Um, if you increase, that had about 10 light guides in it. Um, if you were to increase the number of light guides dramatically, uh, you creating a model to interpret what's happening based on that large number of outputs may be difficult. Um, probably people in this audience could do it, but we're using machine learning uh, instead. The, this is, these are 30, 30 optical fiber outputs from a foam actuator. Uh, and then uh, Ilse van Meerbeek, who's at Lawrence Livermore now, trained a statistical model uh, to determine, to classify the deformation state, whether it's bending or twisting, and then regress the angle within those uh, predictions. This is one of her reconstructions of what's happening here. Um, and the, the dashed plane, the dotted planes are the error boundaries. And it does pretty good within certain angles. Um, in this case, she actually used pla uh, 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 plastic light guides below their glass transition. So they don't do well at very really large strains. Um, but I think we can, we can use the same approach with our elastomeric ones and, and get uh, even, even good accuracy to very large angles. But it's pretty good. Uh, we can get into the details of the machine learning stuff if you want, but um, I think uh, it, it's actually not that interesting. But the, the printing, com so all of this stuff is really complicated to make. Uh, and if you were to make a robot, a full scale, full stack robot with all of these features embedded in there, it would take forever and probably not work using normal methods. So we're, we're very invested in getting 3D printing to work for our fabrication. Uh, we're choosing to use um, light uh, as our method of printing because it's a larger, it's, it's, it's fast for the area you get. 
Um, there are limitations currently, just um, financial limitations to how large an area you can print. But I think that'll be solved pretty soon. This is a carbon M1 3D printer and it's printing, I'll show you in a minute, these are um, uh, trans uh, what we call autonomic transmission systems that we put into some of our robots. Um, but it's a scalable method of creating complex architectures, at least for the scales of robots we're working at now. Uh, we, Kevin O'Brien, uh, who recently graduated, printed this hand. Uh, and inside of it, it's just attached to this robot arm, but actually the robot arm is doing nothing other than holding it in place. The computation power control is all bedded in the palm of the hand. And we can do that because the complexity afforded by the 3D printing process. Um, this is not a pneumatic actuator. This is a tendon-based approach. Those tendons are pulling on the fingers and we printed living hinges into the fingers so that they bend where they're supposed to. And each one of those white pads is actually a time of flight sensor that's telling the controller when to grip, depending on the, on the situation. So when Kevin is throwing a ball at his hand, it's actually making a decision to close and grab it on its own. And it can do it very quickly because it has these passive transmission systems or these autonomous transmission systems that allow the hand to close fast. But after they're closed, it squeezes it, makes it a smaller radius and allows it to apply higher torque. This is a better visualization of what I was describing. These are the elastomeric, pass, I guess, passive transmissions in here that are winding the tendons. Um, and, it, and at high radius, again, allow it to close quickly, but then when closed, pull on, on the radius so it gets smaller and apply higher torques. That's how we're able to crush that can, but still grasp it. So we can also use feedback control mechanisms to allow it to grasp quickly uh, but have that compliance to prevent it from damaging things and then stop the actuation before it can get to high enough torque to damage things. Uh, working, so um, TJ Wallen and, and Brian Peel graduated at different times, but they worked together to create a, a, a synthetic um, a, a approach to printing silicones in um, these projection stereolithography systems. This is a uh, mercapto siloxane, and this is a divinyl siloxane. Um, you can change the mechanical properties by the molecular weight of the divinyl system and the degree of substitution of thiol groups onto this uh, polysiloxane. And when you do that, you have control over um, how stiff it is, how high it is, and how much you can strain before failure. Um, Two and a half percent mercapto. Uh, and 17,200 molecular weight, uh, you know, varying these things. The most important thing is that we can get um, uh, high resilience from these materials. Um, so over 100 cycles, no change in mechanical properties at the time, that wasn't happening. Um, since then, uh, systems like the Carbon and, uh, and a few other uh, printers have very resilient, very good elastomers. Um, oh, another thing to point out is while we, um, having a hard time going back. Okay, yeah, this, this 20 kilojoule uh, per meter cube toughness, uh, Jigong will laugh at, and it, it's, it's true, it's very low toughness. And so um, TJ, after graduating, continued on to do a postdoc at uh, Facebook Reality Labs. First, I'll, I'll play some of the things we printed out of these silicones, just showing it's very soft, um, but it, it will fracture fairly easily. Uh, they didn't stop us from making you know, little demo actuators and stuff like that. Um, but you know, working with him at Facebook Reality Labs, it really him, he and he doing, doing this stuff, um, they created a chemically orthogonal uh, network to, to photolithographically print the structure um, out of this thiolene click reaction. And then after printing, do a post-cure tin catalyzed reaction to create the really tough silicone. And this is what's normally done industrially. If you have a silicone, it's probably using a platinum or tin catalyst uh, thermal cure to create the very tough silicone. It actually also probably has a lot of nanoparticles in it. Um, but in this work, there's no nanoparticles. And you can, he can increase the toughness 
um, from that 20 kilojoule per meter cubed down here up to one and a half megajoules per meter cubed, depending on which um, concentration of tin cure and which uh, versus um, uh, photo initiated quick reaction. Another benefit of this system is if you print the structure you want, but then don't do the condit delay the condensation reaction, you can uh, put it in contact with things and then do the, the, the reaction and then create a very uh, high strength bond. And he demonstrated that with this um, uh, bonding the silicone and silicone is very hard to bond to things normally. You normally think, how am I gonna bond silicone to something else? Um, so this is onto a flexible PCB uh, with LEDs um, and the point is, skip to it. He's trying to delaminate that flexible PCB from the silicone and it doesn't break at that bond, it breaks elsewhere in the silicone. So it's a very good technique. Even more important, I think, than the toughness is this adhesion strength. Um, there's opportunities to increase that toughness even more though. Uh, we know that adding nanoparticles can uh, increase the energy required to propagate cracks throughout uh, a toughened rubber. And, and almost, I think actually every silicone that you use or polymer that you use that, that you want to be tough has probably fumed silica in it. So we decided to add nanoparticles to our thiolene resin, not the double network, but the thiolene resin before that was 20 kilojoules per meter cube toughness and uh, try to print with it. Uh, to increase the toughness. And if you look at the viscosity range down here, um, you go from a very low viscosity, around five pascal seconds, um, up to 1,000 to 10,000 pascal seconds when you go to around 20 weight percent um, of, of uh, silica, fumed silica particles. Uh, now you could add, you could do a better job of dispersing the nanoparticles so you can add more. But the point of this work wasn't really to make the toughest silicone we could, it was to explore the effect of nanoparticle additives on printing. Uh, the yield stress also goes up, but the yield stress uh, doesn't go up, this is 10 pascals, to a point where it actually matters that much on the flowability in this type of system. It's the viscosity that really dominates the problem. But if you can go from uh, you know, 0% nanoparticles to 20% uh, by weight, you dramatically increase the toughness, even without the double network approach. But you can't go up, you can't increase, keep increasing the viscosity at infinitum because there's problems with printing. In this is a 15 by weight percent uh, nanoparticle dispersion in the thiolene siloxane. And it can print, it's not perfect. If you look at the confocal microscopy of the surface, you see some roughness here, um, but it is still useful. If you go to 20%, you can't print it at all and you're left with these voids um, and a, just a gelatinous goo here. What sets this limitation is the uh, Peckley number uh, or the relaxation time of the nanoparticles or the nanoparticle agglomerates in this uh, matrix. And you know the relaxation time of particles here is set by the um, particle size and the temperature, as well as the uh, uh, infinite shear viscosity. Um, and so when you're pulling up, when you have your build head in this printing system, the best thing you can do is put it, immerse it within the vat. If you immerse it within the vat and you pull up on it, you create a suction that allows this liquid to be pulled in to the new layer. If you don't immerse it in this vat, you don't have that suction, and then you will just pull your build head out um, and nothing will flow in. But there's still a limitation onto how uh, viscous this vat can be and still get that flow without events like cavitation, uh, which will a lot break the, um, the seal and, and ruin your vacuum assisted printing. And that it fits pretty well, uh, shoot, didn't put it in here, to uh, we have a, a plot of uh, printability versus Peckley number and really at one, which is by the shear rate or how quickly you're pushing, pulling this up to the uh, area that's 
um, being explosive to the fluid, um, it's around one where it starts to fail. And so we're pretty confident that uh, the relaxation time of the uh, suspension is what's dominating the printability at higher uh, nanoparticle concentrations. Uh, so to, to further motivate why nanoparticles are useful uh, beyond toughness, this is a different system. This is not siloxanes, this is a uh, acrylamide. But in this acrylamide, we've added a cationic monomer and an anionic nanoparticle system, sulfonated silica, which creates a uh, nanoparticle um, covalent polymer, nanoparticle, ionic nanoparticle bridge between the ionic network and there's a secondary network of a covalently bonded hydrogel. And that uh, increased the toughness versus not having these uh, uh, sulfonated silicon nanoparticles. Um, we can, I don't, I don't have the control here, but it, it does. And the cyclical loading, it's uh, over 100 cycles. Um, it behaves the same, it has the same stress strain behavior, but you see a change, a uh, shifting, um, and that's, that's from evaporation of the solvent. So we need to solve that problem. Uh, biology solves it by drinking water. So we, we think a similar solution as well as using uh, more hygroscopic um, salts and other things could help too. Uh, but we, the other benefit besides toughness in hydrogels th that we were really going for was ionically conductive um, function. This is a 3D printed touchdown the bear Cornell mascot uh, that we can just plug in electronics. We just did an LED uh, and then drive an AC field uh, to power this LED. And that's basically where we left it, but I promise that we didn't hurt the bear in any of these experiments. So this is a um, sort of comprehensive view of the different types of systems integration we're trying to do towards a uh, autonomous robot that can operate for a long period of time with high dexterity. It's a long way to go, but I'm very happy to have a very great group of students to work on it with. This is in 2018 and this is 2020. Uh, you know, the pandemic can't keep us from smiling. So that's uh, pretty great. I'm very lucky to work with all of them. And uh, the funding to do this has been supported by the AFOSR, NSF, um, ONR, ARL, and uh, NIH. And I would love to talk with you more about this and get ideas from you. Hey, that's great. Yes. Hey, Jamie. Can't hear you. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for all. That's amazing. Um, I, the last time I saw your talk was not that long ago, but this is amazing uh, progress and always new slides. So thanks again for sharing this um, uh, progress and the latest of your lab with us, all of us. Uh, right now we have uh, 158 participants. So this is really uh, uh, a feat for all of us. I'm glad I didn't know that when I started. <laughs> Doing some screenshots here. Um, so I think we are at the floor is open for questions if you're ready to take some. Mm -hmm. Just don't make them all. Yeah. Okay, you can make them hard. Andy, I think you're allowed to talk. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, Really interesting presentation, Rob. Uh, Robert, um, I also work in soft robotics, and I had a question for you about your materials you were mentioning at the end, those UV printable elastomers. Um, I was curious, you know, usually when you... Um, I can't hear you now. Can anybody else hear him? No. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm back. I okay. had a sudden disconnect. Um, my question was, so on those, those UV principle um, elastomers you were mentioning, um, usually you see this trade-off, usually these like tough materials tend to be the top, tend to be the stiffer elastomers. And so I was wondering what kind of stiffnesses you were seeing on your elastomers. Um, okay, well, I think I see what you're saying. It's kind of a hard question to answer since stiffness is dependent on the shape. So um, I think what you probably is like, what is the highest modulus we can print and still get high extensibility maybe. 
Well, actually, no, I would, it was really the reverse. So what is the lowest modulus you get with your uh, printed elastomers? Yeah, well, that would definitely be a hydrogel. And I uh, believe it's tens of kilopascals. OK, interesting. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for the question. Hey, Rob, can I ask you a quick question? I can't find my hand thing. Um, yes. First of all, wonderful talk as always. It's impossible to not be inspired by your group's work. Um, I guess I didn't appreciate before kind of how the build platform immersed in your viscoelastic resins might impact ultimate printing. Could you speak a little bit on kind of what are the limitations that you see right now? I mean, I imagine how far in that platform is into the resin actually is going to change the ultimate effective Peclet number at certain, you know, print builds in certain areas. So can you elaborate a little bit on kind of where you see issues with, with printing with that system? Um, so I think most of the time you, you do the same Z height each time. So you might have some exotic way to print where you're changing that height and the rate you go, but we don't, we don't do that. So that doesn't really uh, matter. Um, we, we have found that you can heat the vat and when you heat the vat, you change the relaxation time. So you can uh, print higher nanoparticle concentrations um, or, and actually works, what works better is to just change the rate at which you're moving the platform. But when you do that, you also take much longer to print your system because one of the reasons we're doing it is, is using uh, DLP is that it's uh, very fast per layer, but you know you accumulate many many layers, and it can take hours. And if you double the, if you half the rate, um, then you can double probably the nanoparticle concentration. Um, but then you're also taking twice as long to print your parts. So there's that that optimization that needs to happen. But we're pretty confident in our, uh, the our understanding of the um, at least basic physics that's governing it. So yeah, I would, depending on the toughness you would use, you'd have to determine if the time was worth it. I mean, I guess a quick follow-up too that I was kind of interested in. When I first read that paper, I was kind of reminded of the stuff Randall Erb and Andre Studart had done, where you look at orientation of different filaments in a field. Mm -hmm. um, have you thought, because now you can put fillers in, thinking about looking at some, it'd be very crude and maybe rudimentary, but still an interesting way to think about alignment as you pull fluid in with anisotropic fillers? And maybe tuning the conditions such that you might be able to have like disoriented in one layer kind of aligned and splayed in another. Have you kind of thought about anything like that? Yeah, my student Schwo would be very excited that you think that's useful because he he's got a paper he's editing right now that 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 does take advantage of that. I also cool. like to point out that the whole idea came up when actually John Rogers visited Cornell and he he saw one of our, our first printers. And then I don't remember exactly what he said, but um, I was incorrect with the response to a question. And then I thought about it later, why it, it, isn't it true? And then I looked at the literature and everybody seemed to think you needed five Pascal second viscosities to print in these systems. But the only reason was that you weren't, people weren't putting the build head within the vat. Yeah. Um, and so if you just put the build head in the vat, you can go to much higher viscosities you can print with, which opens up a lot more things. And I'm sure the community knew that, but it wasn't formally described. Um, and we didn't know that. So John's question, which I think was how fast does it refill? Maybe, um, it's like not very fast because like, it should be instantaneous. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, well, I need to think about this more. Awesome, thanks. I'll have more for you. I think Yako can go next, I think in that order. Uh, sure. Thank you. Thanks, Rob, for the great presentation. And uh, you may you mentioned briefly, you know, comparing the light sensors and you know the DA based sensors, right? As a and obviously you invested in the light sensor. But could you hire, you know, if you if you step back and take objective view on the pluses and minuses of two different systems, if you think about practical implementation, you know, how would you compare them? What are the pluses and minuses? Well, the DESs are um, more mature and they have, uh, it's to individually address them electrically is currently easier to do. 
So you can have, you can multiplex fairly easily electrically. Um, so that's a big advantage over the current version of the optics. What I like about the optics though, is you can use wavelength as well as intensity um, and have another variable to tune. Um, we, we have some really good results on that that are um, about to be published, but it's, uh, it's I, and also the, the um, optical systems uh, have different sensitivities. So if you don't do a good job cladding them and you use them out in the sun, that's gonna provide a lot of noise to you. You can maybe uh, mask it and, and things like that, but uh, they're not, we still need to you know, explore this and, and prove it, but I, I feel like they might be less sensitive to moisture um, and uh, other types of electromagnetic interference beyond light. So there's probably places they're useful that DESs aren't and places that DESs are useful where the light guides aren't. And we're trying to figure out to carve out those regions. Thank you. Thank you, Yako. Next is Tiana. Hey, uh, sorry, I, I forgot to unmute myself. Uh, well, this is Tian Tao from uh, University of Alberta in Canada. Thank you for this uh, amazing talk. Uh, I have a question about the uh, uh, double network silico uh, material that, that, to my understanding, you 3D printed it. I, I wonder if you could elaborate on how you did that and what is the happening mechanism? Because I, I know many of the multi-network materials like multi-network hydrogels or uh, elastomers, they rely on a pre-stretched network and then uh, the breaking of the chains to dissipate energy. So I wonder if you could uh, elaborate on uh, what is the toughening mechanism in this material that you 3D printed. Thank you. Yep, th that's a great question. I'd like to first say that I was highlighting TJ's work. Um, I wasn't that involved in that, but uh, it was an extension of you know stuff we're interested in. But it, I, I, you know, to it's the toughening is not really that it's a double network. The uh, printing comes from the photo uh, polymerization or the photo cross-linking of the thylene framework. And then the toughness comes, that holds the shape and allows you to do um, DLP. But then the, um, the toughness really comes from the tin catalyzed silicones, commercially developed silicones that he adapted. Uh, so, it is a double network, but that's to allow the manufacturability, not the toughness. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Brian? Awesome. Uh, good early morning to everybody. Uh, great to see you. I see by the faces on the screen at the moment that um, robotics attracts an unusually young crowd. Um, so. Uh, here's a question from a dinosaur. Um, you, you, um, I, I, I was really fascinated by many aspects of the talk, Rob. Thank you very much for all of that. Uh, one of the things that really uh, struck me was the density of sensors you put into some of the devices you have. Uh, and um, if, if you don't mind me putting it this way, to a certain degree, the uh, positioning of the sensors is kind of random. You put them in, in large quantities in a lot of places. So uh, they generate then uh, a pretty massive uh, real-time stream of data. Uh, and then you show uh, things which, if I saw it and understood you correctly, include things like a hand that catches flying objects, uh, which is pretty impressive, actually. So uh, if you think of a situation like that, for example, but there are many others in what you showed, we have this uh, huge stream of real-time data coming from sensors whose positions you may well know, or perhaps in a generalization you don't know perfectly well. And out of that, you want to send instructions to a fairly significant number of uh, degrees of freedom in your robotic device. So in the middle of all of that, uh, you've got something that's replacing the human brain. Uh, can you say anything uh, quickly about a couple of aspects of that, such as where we stand, in that AI problem of mapping sensory input onto useful action, uh, and whether or not you can jam all of that into the device itself. And can the right hand itself contain that kind of uh, computational power? Thank you. 
really great question, and uh, I can answer part of it, but uh, really need a data scientist to respond to a lot of it. But um, you, one of the very cool things about the soft materials, you normally don't think of it as, as a good thing, but they're highly damping. So um, you can pre-process a lot of mechanical information that doesn't need to get sent to the brain. So I can Squee I can grab this without really knowing its exact dimensions and just over grab. Um, and it, that, that, that damping also helps with machine learning, which I think I think is going to be needed um, to take advantage of the density of sensor information that you're talking about. And uh, um, Peko Hosoi gave a talk that I saw once um, and I don't want to uh, misquote her but what I understood the point, one of the many points is that um, when you have these damped systems, the third and fourth order effects you might get from a highly stiff system go away so you can more efficiently train a model um, to, to do what you want it to do. And we see when we use um, uh, statistical methods like K nearest neighbors, um, we can train our our manipulators or our soft systems with these sensors in very quickly, which I, you know, I just took it for granted because I wasn't trained in statistical analysis of data that that's just what happens, but it's very fast compared to um, comparable systems. And um, we used uh, convolutional neural networks, which were able to very efficiently and to high accuracy predict gestures when you were to, when you interacted with the soft surface. Um, and so I think that soft robotics is very compatible with machine learning. Um, and we consider it an effective method of uh, the, actually the best method for me anyway, to approach training the brain of the robots, uh, mostly because uh, the, the tensor flow does the work and I don't really have to, but uh, you know, other than that, it seems to be effective too. So. I think it's a great question. I don't know all the answers to it, but that's my opinion. Thank you. That's fine. First thing? Yeah. Hi, hi, Rob. Thanks for a fantastic talk. I love how you always take us all the way from molecular bonding to full robots to the end users. Uh, that's very impressive work. Uh, so speaking of someone on the like more on the latter side, I really like that you highlighted sort of the, the problem with doing you know, slow soft robots and fast soft robots, and there's not many people on the latter end. Um, so I don't quite have an understanding of all the chemical bonds and stuff, but what are the implications for that if we wanted to do fast robots with, with sort of intrinsically soft materials? Um, it's, a, it's an important observation. And I think the main problem isn't necessarily the materials, but the mass transport required for actuation. So. If you have uh, a, di a dielectric elastomer actuator and you apply a potential difference, you get an instantaneous response almost. You know, there's some relatively to a fluidic system where you have to move liquid into it to cause it to move. Um, and the smaller that is, the more exacerbated that problem is with the pressure drop moving these things, these fluids around. Um, in a lot of these um, uh, field driven in, in almost every approach to soft actuation, a high surface area to volume ratio um, of energy input to actuator output would solve. So hydrogel, sw osmotically swollen hydrogel actuators are very attractive from a lot of metrics, but not on speed. Um, but if you were to layer a lot of these swelling systems with the um, you know fluid pH salt input, then you could get a fast osmotic actuator, but it's so hard practically to do that. Um, that uh, so that's why I like uh, 3D printing as a way to make these high surface area to volume structures. Um, it's certainly not at the not what biology can do with self assembly of proteins, um, but it's a controllable intermediate between what we currently do, which is bolting together um, things. I also like to point out that, you know, 
uh, DC motors have been around for a long time. They're so nice, but there's comp they're complicated too and have had a lot of engineering involved. If you look, just look at it, you'd think I can't from De Novo, I can't scalably produce that. There's so much winding and blah, blah, blah. Um, I think we're at a similar state in a lot of our soft actuators where it's like, how am I ever going to get that to work in production um, effectively? But uh, they're simpler in many ways than the DC motors that are sort of in competition. So that was a different response, but what did I say? Thanks, Rob. Um, I just want to remind all the attendees who are not panelists are still allowed to ask questions. So you do that by raising your hand and I can uh, put you on the queue. So feel free to raise your hand if you have a question, burning question. But next one, we'll go to Nathan. And I see Jimmy's hand as well. So also, if you don't know how to raise the blue hand, uh, you can show it by your image if you're a panelist, uh, then I'll try to uh, put you on the queue. If not, you can message me privately, uh, Jamie. So next one is, next slot goes to Nathan. Great talk as always. And, and I think a lot of really exciting concepts. Uh, I particularly like the optical fiber kind of sensing aspect. Um, do you have any issues with uh, external light uh, coupling into the system? Like, let's say, particularly if you take it into bright light, like sunlight, does that interfere or cause uh, noise issues in the system? Yeah, there's, so um, we view these as being useful internal to uh, robots. And so we envision them, even though you saw a lattice structure where you could see the fibers, actually being encased inside. And so there would be no external light propagating inside. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so you have some sort of shielding or some sort of uh, something blocking that light. And in cases where we don't, we do put a cladding on it. The cladding, I wasn't, so optical fibers are kind of new to me. Um, and I had just assumed cladding was necessary, but it's not, it actually makes it worse because the index of refraction of the cladding is always higher than air. So um, the problem with not having cladding is that you can get external noise, like you're saying, you can also accumulate dust and oil um, <laughs> and damage that can uh, create a problem with the critical angle and allow light to leak when you don't want it to. So, but also our, our nerves in our body, same thing is true there too, where it's just very well protected and regulated. So I think using these systems internally provides a lot of opportunities for, um, uh, what I also want to try to do with your question is turn it into, um, I think that, that to get a, a long operational lifetimes and high dexterity, we need to embrace uh, complexity in, in, in any way, in a lot of ways. And one of them is that I think the robots are going to be highly dissipative, uh, but we need to have chains, linked chains, these energy dissipations that allow us to efficiently um, use the energy, even though we're going to have to use it to control a lot of things. And so one of those would be embedding the fibers inside fluids um, uh, that would protect them, but allow monitoring of other things. Um, I really just want to get to like a, I want to be able to cut open my robot and see a gory scene. Is what I want. <laughs> Thank you. Could you have a green blood and some red? <laughs> That's a great idea. Well, uh, unfortunately, the zinc iodide RFB is red when it's uh, when it's discharged. So, or even like fluorescent elements inside. That's a good idea. <laughs> uh, next point, one. Another point about the rubber light guides is that I don't think they're as sensitive to scratching and damage as a glass or plastic one would be. So, another reason how that cladding is to prevent that, but I don't think we're that sensitive to it. So. I want to avoid cladding if we have to. Yeah. Uh, next spot goes to Jenna. Yeah. Yeah. Robo. Yeah. Very interesting talk. Yeah. I have a question regarding 3D printing multiple materials in robotic system. So yeah. there is any issue about uh, adhesion between different materials or different layer of materials? Yeah. It's so hard. We initially were going to do that um, in Patricia's work where she had this foam and she's threading the light guides in. We initially wanted to directly print the light guides. The basic problem there is the resolution of the printers. Um, and so you can have a nanoscribe 
print high resolution optical components, but it will take forever to print something that's on the scale of the robots we want to work at. Um, so at the scale we want to work at, the printers have like 50 micron resolution. And so your surface roughness of your fibers will be huge and you'll get these large angles that will scatter all your light before they propagate any distance down the fiber. So, you know, there are possible um, post-processing things you can do. Actually, Hui Chen knows all about this. That's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's what a lot of, uh, what she was trying to do with her printed molds and then mold the fibers we were using. So she had to come up with uh, mitigation techniques to that surface roughness. But directly printing it is something we decided was uh, too hard for us. But I, I love it if you figured out how to do it. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you. Jimmy? I, thank you very much. Uh, the reason I have to raise my physical hand is uh, some of our, you know, the, the, some of us serving as co host don't have that button to press. So we have to show our <laughs> Rob, yes. fascinating talk. Uh, very interesting. Uh, enjoyed very much. Thank you very much. Now, you showed uh, one system, which is this hand, which is the hard robotics with soft sensors on it, so it can actuate very fast. The other system is this crawler pneumatic uh, robots, uh, which is all soft, uh, but it actuates very slowly. Okay. Actually, nature solves that problem by combining them. So we have the uh, skeleton system or endoskeleton system, uh, the bones and so on with muscles. Have you thought about maybe combining these sort of two extremes, creating a robot that would give you both features or both functions? Yeah, so yeah, an endoskeletal or an exoskeletal kind of arrangement with soft actuators and sensors distributed throughout it. I think that's what needs to be done. Um, I know a few people on here that are doing that very well um, right now, and our, our, while I would love to embrace that challenge, um, I think there's enough to do at the component level. Um, so we're just going to stick with making components or organs, I like to think of them as, that we can provide to people who are, who are working on the systems integration of whole robots where the um, skeletal system would be part of it. Yeah, and, and it's, it's an interesting point, Jimmy, because that hand that was moving fast, it was actually elastomer, but the modulus of elasticity was like a megapascal compared to the other two megapascals compared to the other one, which was something like 100 kilopascals. So even with what we would consider soft materials, there still is a huge range of stiffnesses that come out of the structure. So um, we don't have to necessarily have bone uh, with, you know, muscle, we can have uh, cartilage with tendon and whatever, and, and like a fish, had, well, no, fish do have bones. Lampreys don't have bones. And they're, anyway, I think it's a huge <laughs> area that should be explored. And I, uh, I yeah, I, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Nicholas? Hey, Rob. So uh, this is Nicholas Buklas, also from Cornell. So I don't get to see that many of Rob's talks at Cornell, but it's interesting <laughs> to see them online. And this time, I also get the chance to ask him a question because I usually watch them offline and then tell him how much I enjoyed them. So again, this was a really interesting talk. So I have a question, which is pretty much an existential question of a mechanician in the world of soft robotics and machine learning. So you had that very interesting example, which if I remember the mas your machine learning collaborator was uh, Chris Desam, where you learned how fibers deform. So you pretty much create a meta model and bypass, as you said, many people here could build a model to uh, do that. But for you, this was probably easier. TensorFlow does the work. Do you see any gap in that workflow? So where would, machine learning directly coupled with soft robotics uh, ha 
have a gap and where would mechanics be able to help? Not, not on the part of, uh, you know, materials response fracture and stuff like that, more in the, in the feedback loop of uh, uh, controls of robotics, especially now that, you know, with um, incorporation of machine learning techniques in mechanics, in computational mechanics frameworks, some techniques are being extremely sped up. So do you have any examples for where the soft robotics and the machine learning grouping would, would have a gap and a, a place for mechanics? I think it has a gap every location in that I can, it works for me because we can intuitively sort of design something and then train it to work. But um, we, I would love to know where, how many sensors we should place where um, there's, a, there's a, a manufacturing efficiency to be gained from knowledge about what's happening. Um, there, you know, the, the model could be trained um, to tell us it works, but maybe we should have a sensor, you know, two sensors less here and two sensors more there. I mean, not only is it manufacturing, but they consume power too. So is our, our and the whole goal for me is to make robots that can operate for a long period of time. And if the training works so that it can be dexterous, but it doesn't work because the power consumption is, is really large, then I failed. So modeling, predictive modeling, I think is extremely important. It's just, um, you know, there's, there's so many things to do that we're kind of cheating and I admit it's cheating <laughs> and, and we would love help anywhere possible. No, it's, it's not cheating, it works. So it's not, that, that's not cheating, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I think that, that answers my question. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Nicholas, I might quote on you on that. It's not cheating if it works. <laughs> <laughs> Andy is next. <laughs> I like that too. Um, so coming back again to your uh, printing process, I was curious about one thing. So you know, we talk. You know, people have brought out the idea of in, of like embedding like an endoskeleton or something. Have you thought about trying to integrate uh, embedded elements like uh, embedded fibers for stiffeners or like embedding the waveguides somehow or the um, the optical sensors? Sorry, into like into your print process? Uh, and if so, how have you tried that? Yeah, that's a very, uh, the, one of the biggest limitations with DLP printing is the multi-material ability of it. So, you know, with a lot of pain, you can get two materials. Um, so direct ink writing is a much better way to get multi-material printing. Um, so depending on your goal, depending on what you need, you, that would, figure out which additive manufacturing process you use. Um, at some point, we decided, you know, for our, for our for Patricia's foam, where she's embedding light guides, that's another approach to a multi-material system from uh, DLP, which will, where we only have one material option. So you print, you leave voids that you can then add thing in, things in later. And with hyperelastic material, uh, that there's an even bigger opportunity because you can have a void embedded somewhere, uh, pull it apart, put the thing in, and then relax it back. Um, it's it's a manual process, um, but and I there's other techniques too, like um, uh, micro transfer printing, which um, you know John Rogers started a company off of micro transfer lithography, and that's assembly of heterogeneous components. Um, there's combinations of all these things, so. I really just think it depends on what you need. And uh, even, um, oh, I can't remember the name anymore. Well, anyway, there's a lot of these kinds of processes. So DLP is fast and quick um, and, and pretty, you know, there's not a whole lot of headaches in tuning things and, and, and having a print. So that's, that's where we wanted to start. But certainly other additive manufacturing processes have a huge advantage it's over DLP if, if you need to use them. Thank you. Soma? Hey, oh, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Professor Schaefer, thanks for your talk. Uh, I noticed that you said in order to drive the hydraulic soft robotics, uh, we may need a pump with a larger pressure output and a higher flow rate. Uh, I agree with this, but I think sometimes uh, these pumps may be a little surplus. 
uh, sometimes I think a light and small pump is in, enough, especially for some soft robot, a small soft robot. Uh, my question is that uh, how can we know the power we need to actuate the soft actuators? Or maybe uh, how can we select a suitable pump to drive the actuators? Thank you. Yeah, well, we, we have a review paper we're nearly done with, which is on how to do this. Um, and the chart we've made is a, um, a Ragoni plot of a predictive, predicted uh, power output versus predicted energy, predicted power density versus predicted energy density, where we try and capture all these possible configurations of things and sort of just create this imaginary design that would, that would do that. Um, and for your specific question, then we just would do, you know, DPDV of the fluidic actuator um, and, uh, you know, I, IR of the, the, the power requirements of the uh, pump itself. And there's a lot of other inefficiencies along the way in that too, depending on if you have um, uh, relays and um, plenums and whatever. But uh, I think in this case, you could modeling would, would be, you know, sufficient to tell you what, what power requirements of the pump you need for the pressure and volumes you're looking for in your fluidic actuator. Yeah, okay, thank you. But I like what you said uh, in uh, small pumps versus big pumps and probably a lot of a lot of small pumps would be better than one big pump. Uh, uh, yes, <laughs> actually we are trying to fabric some small pump micro or maybe micro pumps to drive the actuators. So yeah. it is very yeah, uh, pa uh, puzzle me that Herb how can we need? Herb Shea at Jamie's Institution has done a lot of good stuff with um, these very small pumps. You need a yeah. lot, but depending, you know, where to get to get large flow rates, but you can put them ex where you need them. Um, it's it would be like how we have our muscles distributed everywhere. Yes. Um, so you know that's it requires complexity, but I, that's again what my message is. I think we need to embrace complexity. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Who? Yes, he got disconnected. Phil, you're next. Yes, no, thank you for the opportunity. And Rob, really appreciate your talk um, and uh, different ideas you bring together in a really art artistic way. Um, I had a question that kind of follows up on Brian and Nicholas's comments. You know, I, I'm really intrigued by this, this mapping really that Brian described and from, you know, you have your input to some actual decision or <coughs> functionality. And uh, that's particularly interested uh, from the Air Force's perspective for the mapping mechanical inputs to some sort of operational output. And yet most of our systems, particularly like our aircraft systems, that is the sensory input is really these aerodynamic loads. And so I've just been wondering that we know there's computation going on there because there's an analog version of, there's a digital version of that that we, that we map it through. Like for instance, in your machine learning example, we, that learning of the de deformation has a computational cost that you were able to quantify by creating a machine learning rep you know, representation of it. But I'm wondering if your thoughts, and this is kind of opening up for the panel as well, you know, and others, um, like if we, if there's still work to be done or, if, you know, the current status, I'm thinking about what is the, what is the actual computation the mechanics is doing intrinsically and, and particularly like what mechanic, what computations are mechanics good at doing? Um, and should that sort of change the paradigm of how we approach the design of the robot of, of sort of putting in the computational task as part of the design constraints? Um, I'll have a quick response to that, but I, I'm glad you opened it up to the panel because I expect they'll have better ones. But uh, uh, one, I can think of one technical, technological example of how we could use, uh, how we could, we could create reflex actions um, that wouldn't require any computation at all other than mechanically, where, you know, these aerodynamic loads, you probably, there's certain combination of them would have a, a response that you would always do. And so if you have networks of these light guides upon like the say flutter, they're, con they're touching in a certain configuration 
the optical output would um, have a switch that you know causes an actuation response to dampen the vibrations or something like that. So that would remove any normal type of computation and it would be totally mechanical. But um, you know that I, I'm probably not answering your question, but hopefully somebody else will. <laughs> And raised her hand. Maybe I can make a comment on that. Uh, so, uh, one of our previous uh, EML webinar speakers, uh, Martin City, actually, uh, at his presentation, he started with what he called uh, calculated intelligence versus physical intelligence. Physical intelligence would be the type of responses that are built into the system. You don't really need. Uh, any calculation at all. So the system would respond automatically. Uh, and many of the uh, actually uh, natural systems are like that. Uh, but the calculated intelligence, what he called calculated intelligence, uh, which is what Phil you're referring to, that involves some processing, either by the brain or by computer or by some kind of software. So generally speaking, the physical intelligence, the response time is much faster. It tend to be, uh, they tend to be local, uh, whereas the so-called calculated intelligence, uh, it tends to be uh, centrally controlled and it requires time. I'm just curious along that on that those two descriptors descriptors there must be a continuum I guess where it's it's hard to sort of distinguish between them at some point. Uh, certainly, but uh, I'm I'm not the expert to answer that question. Maybe some other panelists can uh, jump in. There's there's different nerve our our nervous system is broken into. I think there's, I'm not fully versed in this either, but like two or three, one of them being the autonomic one, which would be the reflex actions. And then uh, I guess the central nervous system, which is what Jimmy's saying. So I'm not sure, I don't know. There must be the gradient you're talking about, but at least the level I know it's broken down into the autonomic one and the central one. And as many autonomous responses, autonomic responses as you can get, I think would be um, the, one of the goals. Be gone. Hey, thank you. Uh, uh, Rob, this is a fantastic talk. Uh, you, you're really, uh, Kirsten has mentioned this. You're in an unusual position to start with molecules all the way to uh, realistic systems, uh, very impressive. But most researchers don't, are not in that position. They can take only small piece of uh, the whole thing, uh, either start on molecular ends uh, uh, or doing mon uh, materials or somehow improve 3D printings. So, um, but the field you're in, there's a soft robotic field and multiple fields like that is in a stage really um, require a lot of people's help, but other people find it difficult to help. For example, I'll give you a concrete example. Jen mentioned a specific problem. You confirm it is a problem, adhesion, between especially new sets of materials, such as hydrogel with more traditional materials. Uh, you probably know uh, my group and a few other groups actually spend a lot of time to relate, right? you know, study that problem, try to provide a solution. But then the moment we try to integrate to system or not, no, forget about system, but just integrate to self printing setup, we find we're limited because we don't know these uh, constraints uh, very well. Now the question for you and also for Jamie, uh, you know, for any people who have that breadth of soft robots, how, do you have advice 
for people um, who have an interest, genuine interest in what you do, but don't have your breadth, want to contribute. Uh, what are the challenging problems that we can solve more better defined? It doesn't matter how you solve it, just spend time, it's valuable. And other things are emergent. Or do you have a review for this kind of thing as well? Any opportunity I have to defer materials, no, Jamie. Uh, mechanics and <laughs> I think the, the question is it does multifaceted action. Um, so I, I definitely think so. I think I mean even though soft robotics seems like a new buzzword, but it's been around since what at least 10 years, right? And it has matured a lot in a sense, even though it doesn't look it and it, compared to the classical robotics and controls and uh, different type of architecture, it's not as, as concretely and solidified. And that's why the that's why it's really exciting and that's why it's so multidisciplinary. And it touches on a lot of different types of demographics as well in terms of industry and academia. The reason it's a little skeptical still at the moment is because there's no go-to materials, go-to component, no off-the-shelf solution that exists right now. And that also means that that's opportunity for other disciplines, other industries to come in and jump in. Because we already recognize there's difficulty in, what do you say, the, doing the surgery for robots, the soldering, the wiring, the cables, the circuitry, the uh, circuitry, whether it's a traditional circuitry or fluidic circuitry, it's all difficult challenges. And if you wanna do mechanics, fluid mechanics, there will be questions there because most fluid mechanics models that we are using right now is based on a very gross assumption. They have very good models for the microfluidics, but the scale that we're working on, the mesoscale, it doesn't apply that well either. The walls are never completely rigid. It's a softer wall. So the control is completely different. The model changes. So I think it's better time now than ever that we have more define challenges that exist in front of us. And we usually finish our you know, um, paper with, you know, in our future work, these are the things we're gonna look at. But that doesn't mean that we're only gonna be the one looking at it. It's opening questions for the rest of the community as well. That goes beyond just self robotics community. So any of you are writing a review on materials or mechanics challenges, because this is EML webinars, right? Materials and the mechanics are main auth yeah, authorships. It sounds like an invitation paper here. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> it's Indeed, <important>. Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> Please Jamie, think you are, about uh, it. Uh, Rob, uh, are you guys uh, writing up such a paper? You must just, just just today's talk, Rob, you already mentioned multiple challenges and then you use your cleverness. Oh, this is an important problem. We solve this way. Let's move on. I appreciate your attitude. I admire your attitude, but the problem probably is still there after you avoided that or yeah. bypass it. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. We, we, we like to provide clever tricks uh, to avoid real problems. <laughs> So yeah, I think uh, I think going back and actually identifying um, the things that we couldn't solve, I think is a very uh, would be. I think it's that's a good idea, and it goes in line with what I was trying to say before uh, before the talk about you have these very complicated things you want your graduate students to do, and sometimes they don't work out. And um, instead of not publishing that, publishing it, but with a you know focus on why it didn't work and what could be done, I think is. Uh, in, in a, re, in a re, review format, that would be interesting. I haven't seen that. Oh, that's... Yeah, maybe I, um, let's have a specific problem. Hmm. Or I heard from multiple people, today you repeat it again. Mm -hmm. The problem is uh, now, let's say you want to, many technologies want to use 3D printing. Mm -hmm. uh, the printing itself requires set of uh, properties and materials. But after printing, you want to have, let's say, you want to have high toughness. You also want to have, uh, let's say, high strength or some kind of strength. Or maybe you want to have a low hysteresis. All these are requirements, well-known requirements for lots of applications. But now, just because you need to print, these two things uh, do not come together. So I guess uh, more specific, what is the outlook at this moment 
printed materials can achieve the desired properties. What is the outlook as far as you know? Yeah, it's, uh, we need new innovations for sure because the, the, the solutions that DLP as well as now uh, VAM provide um, are speed and speed at high resolution, but not multi-material. Um, but the, the multi-material solutions that work very well aren't very fast. So hybrid approaches um, to, to, um, to additive manufacturing for uh, the, the multi-material, but also the bonding between these materials, um, that is a huge challenge. And actually had a work, I was at a workshop, an NSF workshop about this, these challenges, and we left with, uh, oh, well, we don't know what to do. So <laughs> I think uh, uh, revisiting the notes from that workshop in, in, in the form of maybe not a proposed solution, but um, summation of challenges. That's, inter that's interesting to me. That's interesting to you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Jinsu? Thank you. Um, thank you, Rob. I, thanks for the wonderful talk. I'm Junso. I'm a fourth year graduate student of GIDA. Um, I, I have a question on the pneumatic actuators. Uh, as far as I know, pneumatic actuator is very good for soft actuators because the medium is soft. This is air or water, which is not solid. So I was working on pneumatic actuator for a year. Uh, and I recognize uh, one limitation and um, that was wiring. So let's say I want to um, mimic our face. Face is made of multiple muscles. If I try to mimic our face using pneumatic actuator, I, I need a, a pipeline for the medium and, this, and the wire for the signal. Each one is serial, not parallel. So I need one-to-one -one wiring for each muscle. Then the muscle becomes, uh, the, the wire becomes so big and I couldn't integrate it into a piece. Another problem is the energy. Um, medium is related to the energy rate. So the number of molecule is uh, just really proportional to the power of the actuator in the case of the pneumatic actuator. So if the pipe becomes small, my power becomes small because I cannot push a lot of um, air molecule into a small pipeline. Um, on the other hand, our human muscles use a different path. Uh, the power source is, is, is around the muscle, is keep diffusing in. So it's almost endless uh, for a short time. And the signal, signal can be transmitted into a very, very a narrow uh, neuron. So it can be integrated. So I think this is the reason why we have the high power and uh, a lot of uh, multiplex control in our body. So how can we resolve this issue using a pneumatic actuator or what kind of actuator can mimic this kind of integration of the uh, actuator? Well, that, it's amazing that you are um, a graduate student still because I think coming up with problems to solve is one of the things you should learn in graduate school. And that's, th those are what I have myself identified as the biggest problems with the fluidic actuators. I mean, to, to, to be positive, they, um, and actually a question back to everybody here, I think that fluid actuators are, are so good because the molecules or the moles of gas are doing the high surface area to volume work that, um, you would get from layers of DEAs and stuff like that. So it's just a kind of something that's been back like a fundamental um, handle on, on why FEAs are so useful because I don't think they have the same trade-off, but that I could be wrong. But back to your other question about how to do, um, how to do, uh, it's a, a lot of people are working on this problem and uh, multiplexing uh, of fluidic channels there's a way to do it. There's um, old work from this guy named Stephen Quake, who worked in microfluidics on quake valves, which takes a few inputs to control many outputs. Um, so that's one solution. Engineering it specifically for robots is a challenge, but doable. Uh, but uh, we won't, on top of that, we need layers of control inputs and not just um, 
we need to communicate. I think we need distributed uh, computation throughout the robot in a way where additional wiring challenges don't don't just add to this con the, the tubing routing challenge. And uh, I hope you come up with a solution because I'd like to use it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The microfluidics is a good good resource to look at for um, potential solutions to fluid handling and yeah. in yeah. fluidically driven robots. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, thank you, Rob, for the wonderful talk. I really enjoyed. Um, and my question is actually related to uh, uh, quite a few previous uh, questions, comments by Nicholas, Phil, and also Jimmy. Um, it's about the uh, the reaction time of uh, of the software robot. Uh, I find that the one of the demonstrations, the videos you showed, is fascinating. He said uh, this robot hand is touching different. Uh, that the tomatoes try to pick the right ones and then you touch and then uh, make a decision the back end you have the machine learning running now if you think about the human reaction right so a uh, typical human reflex is on a order of a quarter of a second right? some people react faster than others but we're talking about 200 to 300 uh, milliseconds there uh, this include that uh, either your eye or your ear, your ear or your uh, your hand touch something or sends the signal, send it back to the brain, the brain process, and then you physically respond to some uh, uh, sensing uh, signals. Uh, now, if you look into the um, the the uh, this uh, uh, software uh, robot hand, um, its process. Um, Definitely, it's slower than this human uh, reflex now. So my question is, if you break down those time to operate the robot hand, uh, uh, actuate it, sense it, and send back to the algorithm to process it, um, then send back to decide, oh, this is the right one, and I'll pick this one. So which section of the uh, of the steps takes the most of time and what is the biggest challenge over there because i know this is a, a also may not may not be a fair comparison because for human being we accumulate this experience over the years right definitely a, an adult will pick the ripe tomato faster than a five year old because you can tell from the color and for example i don't need to touch five of them i touch one of them my experience tells me that, oh this is the right one Right, so we, we learn back in the end, we accumulate. Uh, but I mean, with all these steps considered together, so what do you think the biggest challenge over there to really uh, catch up with the, with the speed? I think the order, the order of bottlenecks is the, in the actuator, it's in the, the specific case of the fluidic actuator I use there is the mass transport of the gas to actuate the finger. Um, that's half a Hertz. Uh, well, no, it's probably like two hertz at best. Maybe, I mean, we have some work that's like tens of hertz. Okay, so maybe tens of hertz, but still slower than our, our hand. Sorry, my dogs are awful. But um, the, ne the next bottleneck after the fluid handling is the uh, classification from the neural network that you would train. And I think a comparison between a four-year-old and eight-year-old is fine. Yeah, I agree the eight-year-old would have a problem, but let's say a uh, 25-year-old before your brain starts dying, um, you're comparing 25 year olds. They should be pretty similar in, in, in computation time. So after you have a fully trained neural network, um, the prediction from the trained network still takes some time. And so I think after the actuator, powering the actuator bottleneck is optimized, it would be the um, predictive time from the, from the trained neural network. Yeah, so this is also skills with, uh, if that is the case, the skills with the size of the, uh, the, the robot as well, right? So the larger the size, it's slower, and as demonstrated, this meter long robot is crawling. Yeah. And so, by the way, you just give a live demo of this reflex. You, you hear your dog bark, yeah, you press the button, that's, that's a fraction of a second. Yeah, these dogs. I have a follow up question here. Because my question is really related to Ted's question. Uh, 
Rob, uh, very nice talk. Uh, so in your sensors that you put on the hand, robot hand, uh, these sensors are self-powered? This is my first simple question, right? The second question is that, does this sensor recognize whatever they have ever grabbed? And you put a ball, uh, you, you throw a ball on the hand, and, 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 and uh, the second time you throw a ball again, uh, does the sensors recognize this is a ball? Is there a mechanism that you embed in your sensor? Uh, so I think this is a, this is a, uh, this categorizes the uh, physical intelligence and so-called the compute, computer intelligence. Physical uh, intelligence is that the sensor will sustain forces uh, that acting on it, and then the computer uh, intelligence is that the sensor will do calculation uh, sent to the central uh, central system and make a decision, make a recognition, right? So I'm wondering if your sensor has the uh, uh, capability to recognize whatever uh, it has ever grabbed before, have the memory uh, kind of functionality. So I think we need to separate the sensor from the control unit. Um, the mm -hmm. sensor can be self-powered in that there are tribal electric nano generators that can, op can power LEDs and our, we have a light based, but you still need to do something with that information on the other side of it. And the computers that process that information can't be run off of tribal electric nano generators. So in that sense, the sensor can be self-powered but the interpretation of the signal can't be. Sure. Um, and so when, when you are um, interpreting the signal, uh, that, that would be, there would be a computer in the loop and then you would train that to, depending on its, you know, the, the model that's been trained to recognize something. But I think one of the goals is to make it so the model doesn't need to recognize what it's interacting with. Um, so if you have a, go a governing limit on how much the, the um, pressure you're putting into the pneumatic actuator, for example, you would be able to pick up a large range of things without having to know what it is you're picking up. Um, and, and maybe that's not what, you're, not what you're looking for, but that's taking advantage of the hyperelastic materials to do material computation to offload what is required from the comp computer in the first place. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but Hui Chen did all that, so you can ask her directly. <laughs> <laughs> um, is Dan still here? If not, Harish? Hi, yeah. Um, hi, Rob. Yeah, thanks for the brilliant talk. And uh, I mean, I, I'm quite, I mean, I've followed your work for many years, followed from your work on electroluminescence, stretchable optoelectronic sensors. So um, one, one question I have is a uh, lot of your work uh, in the domain of soft robotics, it covers a very wide spectrum in manufacturing, sensing, even power recently. Um, but each of these works are still very rigorous right at the forefront of these topics. So I'd like to ask you this general question, what is, what's your approach towards uh, finding these research ideas and the questions to answer? Uh, as a as a early career researcher, I'd like to learn more about this. And also, one uh, more specific question is: uh, when you're building things in the lab, it is tough to jump across different systems like dielectric elastomers. Then you want to do something on pneumatics or shape memory alloys. It's not so easy to build up uh, these systems in the lab hands-on. Um, can you share some tips on how how you approach this? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the question. Um... I'll give real advice, which is if it is starting off, if it's very hard, I would switch to something that's much easier to do. So um, a lot of the approaches we chose early on were chosen because it's, uh, it, it's not gonna take a graduate student three years to get an initial result. Now, since, since we have been around for a while now and have you know, sophistication in different columns necessary to integrate into robots. Our systems are getting more and more complicated, but they're based off of stuff that we know how to do. You know, I wouldn't try to do DEAs and FEAs and um, LCEs and whatever all at the same time, because they're very different things with very different sensitivities. So we did FEAs because they're so simple and they, you know, work off the bat. 
but uh, you know, if I were to cho cho choose LCEs, we just now have some results on that. I've been working on it for like five years to get um, familiar with it. So, uh, and now if you already came in with experience in that, then that would be a great advantage because then there aren't as many people as you who are capable of doing it. So, you know, you have to take that uh, into account. Another thing is collaborations. Um, like most of our papers have like tons of authors on it because we need domain expertise from from other people. So that's two suggestions. But thanks for following my work, man. I was like, <laughs> it's uh, it's crazy for me to hear that from people. Um, so it's, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's because of your great work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Richard. Hey, hey, Jamie. Hey, Rob. Uh, thank you for the talk. And uh, thank you for bringing back many great memories at Cornell. I miss all of the lab members as well as you. Um, actually, uh, today I have a very tough question. I came across this question from my colleagues when we were doing some communications. We were from very different areas. And they asked a very tough question that I don't know how to answer. So I, I want to put this question to you and uh, listen about your uh, like thinking about it. Um, they asked me, what is the scientific foundation of our area? For example, if you want to write a textbook for soft robotics, what are you going to put in the first chapter? Do we already have such a scientific foundation or we are still working hard towards it? Because when I, when I think about the components of soft robotics, for example, our optoelectronic sensor or the actuators like DEAs, like batteries, we all have some scientific foundations behind it. We can model it very accurately. But what is the scientific foundation for this whole area? If I, I just don't know how to answer this question. I think it's not just soft robotics. If you were to ask anybody from the, from the Carnegie Mellon Institute of Robotics, what's the fundamental part of robotics? They're not gonna say thermodynamics of robots, although that'd be nice if they did. Um, <laughs> I think it, I think I think in our case the other people here would be mechanics. I think that's extremely foundational mm -hmm. and important. Um, but yeah, I think it's a complex. I, I wouldn't say that we do, to be honest. Uh, I would say that there's several foundational contributions. And if you can be an expert in one of those foundational contributions. Um, mm -hmm then that's a really big deal. And the people here who are interested in mechanics are certainly in one of those columns. If, if you're a, a data scientist um, and you decide you wanna work in soft robotics, now you are one of the most valuable members of soft robotics. And um, so yeah, I would try to, I think it's a good point and people here should, should try and find that foundational aspect of their research and not just be a systems integrator um, because Soft robotics is eventually just going to be robotics, and um, you want to be able to move across disciplines with your knowledge. And mechanics is certainly a good way to do it. Like your work with Andy Rowena on a lot of our papers, I think, is foundational. So um, I would say you should do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the great talk. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to maybe steer the conversation back to energy. Um, you know, you've been doing some really interesting things there and like, you know, tackling the hard problem of untethering these devices. And I guess I have two part question, you know, when you think about energy, there's the supply side, which is your source and then the demand side, how it's consumed. And uh, I guess I'm curious what your outlook is on the supply side. Like, is there, is there, do we need to be looking at completely new areas or are we kind of on the verge of some breakthroughs even in conventional sources? And then on the second part question is on the demand side, um, is there diminishing returns there? Is there, or is there oppor real opportunities to sort of reduce the required consumption? Cause it seems like soft robotics uh, are not really optimized necessarily to be low energy consumption in that, you know, deformation is a, you know, and estimation is a kind of a key component to their use cases. So maybe you could kind of talk about your vision 
and uh, opportunities on both the supply and uh, demand side of energy. Yeah, a good, I think a good way to, uh, that I think about it is that Watson, IBM's Watson used like 85 kilowatts of power to be Ken Jennings, who was using 20 watts. So um, there's huge inefficiencies between our synthetic systems and our natural systems. But if you look at a internal combustion engine, you know, a diesel one I think is like 60% efficient, something like that. Whereas our muscle is at best 32, 35% efficient. But overall, we're way more efficient at handling rough terrain and um, in, uh, which is sort of my point earlier, but it's how the system is integrated, capturing lost energy, even though we are highly dissipative, we use that dissipation in many, many cascading events to help us overall be extremely efficient. Um, so I think that's the, the demand side first is the energy cascade that um, we need to think about and we're not. Um, and then the input side, I think is fusion. So we just need some, just kidding, <laughs> um, atomic fusion to power our robots. Um, but from, from that side, uh, com I, I think combustion is just fine. So, you know, if you look, if you talk to a lot of people, it sounds dangerous, so we shouldn't use it. But the very first car was a, an electric car. Combustion happened because electric vehicles couldn't do the job at the time. Um, now we've come a long way with electric vehicles, but they're still not beating combustion um, in duration. And, uh, you know, so, but you, and then you're changing your use cases. A lot of shorter range things for electric vehicles, longer, longer range. I'm specifically looking at long range dexterity. And so the energy density of hydrocarbons is an order to two orders of magnitude greater than the electrical power available. So, um, so we are taking a, tr a trade-off in that the combustion powered systems are lower efficiency than the electrical, like the DC motors, but overall the system, uh, the system's operational lifetime is larger. So, and by using small scale combustion events um, distributed over a system, we're getting pretty good results towards uh, or orders of magnitude increase in operational lifetime of these systems. Paul? Hi. Um, yes, yeah, so my name's Paul. I'm calling in from the University of Würzburg in, in Germany. Um, this is my first EML webinar. It's absolutely delightful. So thanks for organizing it. And um, Rob, I really uh, enjoyed your talk. Um, my, my interest is in trying to advance additive manufacturing technologies and trying to keep getting better at what we do. And I noticed that you use the, the carbon 3D system. Is, is that because you need something that has a higher resolution, but also with some kind of volume? Because there's generally a trade-off between these two. Um, and so if you can have a multi-material, high resolution, large volume AM technology, is that the holy grail? Yes, I would. Love. The reason we use the carbon 3D system is that they have great technical support. So if it breaks, they come out and fix it. And uh, that consumed so much of my graduate career is fixing printers that uh, I was glad to offload that service to somebody else. Um, so I would say rely on top of that list of, uh, of options would be reliability too. But yeah, I would love that. So much to do in endo. I mean, I would be working on endoskeletal, like skeleton, like hard, soft systems way more if we if we could directly do that without having to figure out a bunch of complicated manufacturing things because it's going to happen. So if we spend our time working on it now, and then a printer comes out five years from now, then all that effort was kind of like not worth it. So I don't. I just kind of the wait, waiting for somebody like you to provide the systems for us to use. Changyong? Okay, uh, thank you, Jimmy. Uh, hi, uh, Robert, uh, great talk. Thank you for uh, the uh, presentation. Uh, I'm Changyong uh, from Michigan State. So um, I ask a very simple question. 
So now for most uh, soft robotics, uh, we use uh, uh, you know, pretty big size. So uh, what's your uh, uh, opinion for, you know, how, what's the challenge to shrink down and to make it smaller and, uh, you know, to, to be uh, used for, uh, you know, the, the uh, more uh, smaller scale uh, applications? Uh, I, you know, there are many obvious ones, but maybe a less obvious one, I think, is, again, wiring. Like, how do you, how do you connect? Like if you put a copper wire onto a, a millis scale or micro scale robot, then the line tension will prevent you from doing anything. So the other option is wireless inputs and magnetic fields like Metton's work is one way to do it. But complex control over it is pretty limited in that sense. Um, to, to have a, a very small scale robot do what the analogous function of a large scale robot like Atlas would require very complicated control systems in, in IO on board, which I think would make it too heavy right now. Biology obviously can do it because, you know, insects and whatever, but um, I, it's, we're not doing that small scale because it's re it seems impossibly hard to me, <laughs> but uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad people are working on it. Yeah, thank you. Good luck. Ryan? <laughs> Rob, I've, I've heard you talk about this a couple talks now. Um, the trade-off that you presented early on on endurance versus agility is, is interesting. Um, and I qualitatively agree with you. I would really like to quantitatively agree with you outright. How do you think about this quantitatively. It'd be great to like think of some sort of Ashby plot, right? Where we can see how built and biological machines fall on this. Yeah. A lot of, I guess why I want you to kind of elaborate on this a little bit is a lot of the things that we've discussed point to the fact that maybe just soft robots alone aren't going to be a great path towards agile robots, right? They are so slow, maybe except for electrostatics. Um, but in between that, I also kind of can read between the lines and maybe see that you see an opportunity for these systems to maybe help us towards a form of a machine that maybe doesn't require us to face the consequences of that trade-off so dramatically. Is that true? Yeah. Because it seems like there's, I don't know if there's just a soft system that helps us do this. I think that there's an interesting opportunity to link bio-inspiration with what has been done with servos, what's been done with the cognitive advances of intelligence in traditional robotics thus far, and there might be a kind of sweet spot to bridge even what if we're doing with at, soft robotics. Even if you look at marine organisms and an octopus, um, they are very agile, but they consume tons of calories. They have to eat so much. Whereas, um, you know, a, a, I don't know, a tuna or something, you know, a fish, Tune is a bad example because they also do consume a lot of calories. But anyway, a fish that just you know swims for long durations is uh, way more energy efficient for transport than an octopus is. But uh, an octopus can do way more adaptive tasks than a fish can. So even if they're always going to have to make that trade off, we just need to reduce the cost of the trade off. Um, and our distributed network of actuators, sensors, and power is one way we do it. Um, and so I, I simply think that having a skeletal system arrayed with tons of, um, with high degrees of freedom, which would require, uh, also a lot of sensing and local computation is the way at a cost of complexity in the manufacturing. So that's my hypothesis and we're, we're testing it. Cool. But, but that, that Ashby plot, I think is a great idea. Like why well, would imagine the um, cost of transport would be one of those axes, and then the other one would be uh, some kind of like number number of mobility and manipulation functions, something like that. But I, I would love that. I also do want to have some kind of thermodynamics of robots thing, but it's so so uh, hard to even think about it beyond just saying that. Well, and there's a multi-scale issue. There's a there's there's something there that complicates that painting that picture, I think. But I think the trade-off that you've presented, there is something interesting there to learn. And 
I don't know. I've been thinking a lot about it. Good. <laughs> I look forward to you solving the problem, right? <laughs> yeah. Hey, can I ask a question? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Rob. Uh, thank you for the uh, inspiring talk and uh, always uh, can learn something new from your work. And uh, so I think uh, uh, kind of like uh, as you mentioned, like uh, uh, in the robotic community, uh, like uh, there's some work like uh, system integration. Do you think uh, there's also some need or gap about uh, to developing some like uh, enabling technologies? So not only integration, but some basic uh, components that uh, can be really, really uh, have, have better performance, like uh, maybe uh, uh, pumps or maybe smaller skill pumps or human skill, uh, like uh, pumps for human skill applications. Uh, yeah. So uh, do you think there's some gap to do, do this kind of like uh, uh, enabling technologies uh, for the software robotics community? I mean, natural muscle is great because it's generally useful in a lot of different um, applications. Like, mm -hmm. um, it's not the highest power density compared to other systems, not the highest efficiency, but it's um, it's um, it is generally good. And right now, we're we're picking actuators for the thing that we want to be most useful at. But there's always there's huge trade offs in either power or speed or mm. force, you know, yeah. or whatever. So um, I think an intermediate solution that you can layer um, without having to know necessarily what you're gonna encounter when you use the robot uh, is important. And there's no good choice right now for that. I mean, there is, there's obviously an optimum choice, but it's not nearly as good as what natural muscle can do. So one solution is use natural muscle. Um, but that has a lot of complexity there too. I happen to think that that's like 50 years from now, that's what we will be doing, but it's uh, a long, probably insect muscle though, but we're a long way away. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Who's he? Uh, hi, uh, thank you very much, Robert, for this nice presentation. Uh, my, I have two questions. The first one is uh, already answered partially. So uh, did you uh, ever think to use magnetic field or magnetically um, or gels with magnetic uh, particles, for example, for 3D morphing structure? Because in that study, basically, you control the anisotropy, and uh, certainly you can control the anisotropy via external uh, magnetic field. And my second question is really a bit uh, related with the design of a robotics, uh, soft robotics, especially. Now, we are used with the non deformable bodies, and we use kinematics and dynamics uh, in order to predict the forces, position, and velocity of a robot in general in the industry. But soft robotics is a new field, and we need some predictive tools um, to design a robot. Uh, of course, we are a little bit uh, maybe lucky but we can use computational tools but it is up to uh, there is a certain limitation my question is certainly can we use soft robotics if we need a high precision uh, or high repeatability uh, in our processes for example if i want to touch the same point always what is my uncertainty can i predict it do i have the tools to predict that uh, position or it is the same for the force i mean uh, what uh, is the what is your opinion in that? So the first is the magnetic uh, actuator kind of thing, and um, not not the uh, magnetic steering of microparticles, but the use of ferrofluids and magnetorheological fluids as an actuating fluid. Um, and I think uh, the reason we haven't done that is the um, the the weight and size of the magnet you would apply externally for this. Now there's applications I'm sure 
where that's appropriate. Um, and also the penetration depth you can get with magnetic fields. But um, in our goal of mobility, um, adding the, the, the magnet um, to, it's probably a way to do it. We just haven't, we just haven't thought of it. I like it, using it for valving. Um, that's a, that seems to be effective. But it's just one of those like uh, earlier as an like as an assistant professor, what do you choose to work on? There's just so many. There's a soup of options in this space. So what do you do? And uh, magnetic fields is like it. That would be adding a whole different field to controlling your thing, and mechanically is how we chose to do it. So um, anyway, I think that there's there's use, utility there. It, it's not obvious in the space I want to go. Um, and then in the um, in uh, your your next question, which was precision of them, I believe. Uh, um, sorry, um, mainly um, my question is about the design. So as an engineer, I want to predict the position of uh, my fingertip, for example, and the force that I apply, and I want uh, high repeatability. In case of a soft matter, it's rather, I know that it's really a bit uh, challenge, but. Uh, we need some tools and we are used to deal with the mathematics calculus uh, in designing the things, right? And this area is a little bit uh, new and there are lots of uncertainties. Uh, what's your opinion on that? I mean, do we need, can we, the, do we need, for example, some mathematics to predict uh, such kind of uh, design? Proper? Well, I think you need dynamic solutions because momentum in this in these systems are is large and there's nothing stopping it from continuing in the direction you actuated it so even though it will end up in the same position very repeatedly actually surprising you're gonna go past that location unless you move very slowly so um i think that you need to take that into account but otherwise you know i think that using soft actuators for highly uh precise motions is missing the point of it but um you could do that as long as you take into account that you have to either go very slow or take into account the um the momentum in the fingertip okay thank you kurt wick you're still muted hello hello Hi. Hi, Professor Shepherd. Uh, nice to uh, hear your exciting talk. And as other people, I'm also a big follower of your work for several years. So my question will be more like the fundamental side of the stretchable strain sensing. And for stretchable sensing, uh, we have quite a lot of like some of the options, like many of the people have already worked on the resistive and the capacitive. But what you have introduced over there is an optical based stretchable sensing. But from my fundamental understanding, what I know is we still have a lot of drawbacks when we're talking about the optical strain based on the optics. The problem that we have is the poor dynamic performances. We have long-term durability problem as well as relatively slow response time. So do you think uh, using uh, the fundamental uh, tools that what we have, we can we, 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 we can try to optimize this problem. And the second part of the uh, question that I have that you told like uh, in, in, in the fundamental side of the robotics, we have a, 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 a trade-off between the endurance versus agility. And whenever we tell about this endurance versus agility, we talk about the soft actuator, but we never thought about the so soft sensor can we introduce this kind of a paradigm shift to solve some of the problems from sensor perspective to see endurance versus agility problem? Yeah, this is two questions. Okay, so uh, this, the second question, um, I've started to believe that soft robots, robotics, the most useful thing in it is the sensing part um, and the, the wrapping of it over um, endoskeletal kind of robots. A lot of the reason we're so agile um, as animals 
is that we can feel many places on our body. Like touch is a huge, if you look at the, I can't remember what it's called. Um, the mat, it's like a, it's a visual map of the brain according to the sensors. Uh, oh, okay. Well, anyway. Homunculus. Uh, homunculus. Yeah. Homunculus. Yeah. Um, so the touch is bigger than vision in that. Or whether that's true or not, I think you can get people, neuroscientists to argue about that. And I have gotten them to argue about that. But um, touch is a huge part of our brain. And it's not for no reason, you wouldn't spend the energy on that. So we can't, and in our robots, we have reasonable actuation performance, but very poor environmental responsiveness. Even the demos from Atlas, it's doing backflips and whatever, but um, it's not feeling what it's doing. And it, it, it knows what it's gonna do beforehand. So, but if you can't see it and something shifts underneath you, it's gonna fall every time. We don't have that problem and it's because how many sensors we have everywhere. So it, 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 if I have to, we, we made a decision in our group to work less on actuators and more on sensors. Um, one, actuators are really, really hard <laughs> to do. And, uh, and sensors, I think are even more useful anyway on what already exists. So um, that was an active decision we made. And on the, on the light guides for sensing, the, one of the reasons we picked it is that they're so simple there there can be just one material and that's your sen that that is your sensor um and in no other stretchable sensor configuration is there just one material even in the resistive one it's conductive rubber in a in an elastomer so um they're very simple uh we know that silicones generally can be actuated to large strains for millions of cycles and the only problem is in the first few, stre few stretch results. And then after that, it's the, the stress strain curves lie on top of each other. So they should be, we haven't taken them to millions of cycles, but I believe they would work at millions of cycles. So um, yeah, so I think the, the optical stretchable light guides are a really robust solution over long periods of time. We still need to prove that. And, uh, and, and generally sensing just Tons of sensors. That's 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 what we're doing. Just tons of sensors everywhere. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Shreyas. Um, hello, Professor. Thanks for the wonderful talk. It was it was very inspiring for someone as new as me. Uh, I actually had started uh, working on directing writing for. Uh, uh, this field, uh, polymer and soft robotics uh, for my mind. So uh, there was really a question where uh, uh, I stumbled upon, as you said, uh, a process such as uh, DLP. It provides higher speeds, and uh, but but it is incapable of uh, handling multi-material printing. So, is there a way to process to more best of all? I, I lost a lot of what you said. Um, maybe it's a bad connection on my side, but uh, I think your question was: DLP is fast, but not multi-material. DIW is multi-material, but not as fast as DLP. Is there a way to merge the two? Exactly. Yes. Um, I think there is. Um, there's somebody at uh, University of Tennessee. I can't remember his name. I think it's Chris something, but he has a he has a, a, a merged solution of VAT polymerization processes and direct ink writing um, that I believe you'll do. You'll create a layer, come over and write, and then do another layer um, situation. And it's providing some really nice opportunities uh, for him. That was out of the NSF workshop we had, which that was one of the that was one of the solutions we had. It was mix it all together, <laughs> um, not run with it. <laughs> exactly. And um, just just adding on top of that, so uh, in, a, in a case, we try to uh, print embedded uh, sensors into, uh, you know, actuators and sensors printing at the same time. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you think there would be an issue uh, with the error that is generated due to the actuation uh, while sensing. Uh-oh, 
I think I lost the important parts of that, that question. Um, I would actually refer that question. Ryan, did you hear his question? I heard the, the co-patterning of sensing actuation and then static. Yeah. So is there, you were saying there's an error, like I heard error too. Can you repeat your question, please? Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, there's an internet issue on my side. Uh, yeah. So essentially, when we when we try to combine sensors in uh, with the soft actuators, soft sensors with soft actuation uh, actuators, uh, something like a strain sensor or sensor per se. Is, is there a way to avoid that or maybe a machine learning approach to- Yes, we, we lost you just at the, the most important part. So skip the introduction to the question, just, just ask the right words. <laughs> For answers, probably yes. <laughs> or you can quickly type in the chat, so. You get the advantage because I think you're the last one in the queue. If I have not missed out on anyone. We well, Jigong, thank you for doing this. I mean, I think it's, well, it's really a great opportunity for me and it's been hours of your valuable time as well as everybody else's. So I'm honored uh, to be here. So thank you. The reception was amazing. Um, this is one of the most lively and dynamic uh, uh, Zoom calls I've been on since since beginning of pandemic. So kudos to you, uh, to the organizers and the speaker. Yeah. Um, so, but Shreyas, you could email me if you want. We could, I could. Shigal, you're muted. Still muted. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Rob, Jamie, you, you're amazing. Jamie, you have just invented new way to call on people. You actually type their names. Yes. <laughs> brilliant idea. We're going to use this. But Rob, there are just way too many questions. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, maybe we can get you here every time to help us to <laughs> organize. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this Rob, is this nice word, yeah. Re Jamie and both Jamie and Rob and maybe other people really wishing you guys are writing this review of perspective on materials and we will publish this in EML. Okay. Oh, this is recorded. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. For, for example, I was actually uh, also chatting with Hui Chang. I really liked the question she yeah. raised and on behalf of uh, her colleague and also maybe many others as well. That's a great question to think about it mm -hmm. uh, as well. Yeah, open-ended question, yeah. Yep, I got it. Review her email on my list. Thank you. Yeah, 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 <laughs> perfect. Because uh, you guys probably don't sense this because uh, you guys have such a broad bandwidth to deal with uh, multiple uh, moving parts. Mm -hmm. But for most researchers, they have to deal with other moving parts, there's an intersection. Yeah. If this intersection is too unstable, people just cannot help. That's right. And on the other side of it, farther upstream or yeah. downstream, there's roboticists who want to work with us, but yeah. are too frustrated by their fragility of some of the components. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it'd be nice to get a, a full stack roboticist, uh, a yeah. mechanics person. Yeah. I feel like Ryan should probably be involved in, yeah. uh, in Jamie. Yeah, that would be wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the panelists uh, stay all this time. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great Thanks, night. everyone. Thank you all. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.